Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, hello everybody, I'm Michelle Christensen. This is my colleague Florian Conradi, and we have the honor of welcoming you here today. So welcome everyone to the Berlin University of the Arts here to the Design Transfer. Uh, welcome to all our speakers, first of all, who um, are here from near and far. So we have live speakers and we have digital speakers. And to the audience, thank you for joining us as well. To also the live audience, since we're happy to be able to be doing something live again here at the Udika. And also welcome to our digital audience since we are streaming also parallel this event. Um, so Florian and I met Regine and Chris, I would say a year ago in perhaps the fourth and a half lockdown here in Berlin. And um, we met on Zoom which was an interesting experience because we found out that although we hadn't met before, we actually knew pretty much all the same people and worked a lot in similar contexts. And um, there were so many things that we had in common from the hacking and making, of course, um, exploring the potentials and the boundaries of open source, of do it together and do it with other cultures, um, bringing together different knowledge spaces, different practice spaces across academia, arts, design, civil society. And so we thought it would be nice that we could do something together. And we're very happy that we're able to today host the first day here of the Hackers Makers Thinkers Conference. Um, and we're very happy that we're able to do it live in real space. At that point, when we were talking, there wasn't much of an outlook on whether that might ever be possible again. So um, that's just very shortly from our side to maybe you want to add something? I would like to add some thanks, um, obviously, to the whole team of uh, Art Laboratory, uh, Regine, Chris, um, Tuche, Tengal, Neda, uh, Linus, who's taping uh, the whole event. Thank you so much for all your work. And it's, uh, until now, and it will continue, it was really a pleasure to work with you. Um, then a few thanks to um, Ilka from the Design Transfer, where you are right now, um, of the UDK Berlin. It's always so nice to give us this space as well as the Berlin Open Lab, which um, you will explore a bit later after the second panel, uh, which uh, brings me to uh, my biggest thanks to the students, uh, Pablo, Berkay, and Aaron, who would like to um, give you an inlet into their work, their way of thinking. It's called a kind of a micro exhibition, I would say. Um, and they will give you a little tour. So please feel free to enjoy the day today, go into the garden, um, and um, there's coffee, tea, and everything. So we are so happy to have you here. And now I will lead over practical things. I have to do the very practical things. So first of all, um, we are wearing masks here, unless the people who are up here speaking. Um, it's not a prerequisite in Berlin anymore. We just do it to keep each other safe. Um, what's really good to know for the live audience, the bathrooms are around the corner. Otherwise, I get 50 questions. And um, also, just so you know, we are recording this. So there is a live stream which is being recorded of it. So when you ask questions and so on, we also have a photographer here who's taking pictures, Julia at the back. So in case uh, someone is uncomfortable with having their pictures taken, you can just tell Julia and then we know for the documentation afterwards. Those were the very practical things. And then we would like to give over to Regina and Chris, who will tell you a little bit more about the overall Hackers, Makers, Thinkers project and what we'll be seeing today during the day. Hello, everyone. This is Regina Rapp and Christian Deleuze from Art Laboratory Berlin. And we are so absolutely happy and glad to have an in-person physical audience. We have had two conferences in the last two years, completely virtual. And so actually, we're also happy and welcome the worldwide audience here with us. Um, 
Well, um, hackers, makers, thinkers. So first of all, we want to welcome uh, the con to the conference that Adelbert Berlin is very happy uh, to realize in collaboration with the Weizenbaum Institute, uh, the UDK, and the Einstein Center Digital Future. Everything is fine. And um, we want to welcome all artists of the group exhibition Hackers, Makers, Thinkers that we have successfully opened last weekend and that we all, at least the in-person audience, uh, tomorrow explore a little bit further. We want to welcome all speakers of our conference today. We cannot express how valuable it is that actually nearly all speakers are here in person and we can spend time, very valuable parameter time. And uh, we have speakers actually from five continents. So I think it's quite international. And of course, as I said, uh, welcome to the audience joining us virtually and I hand over to Chris. Okay. And today we have 14 speakers um, of which we have, first of all, the exhibiting artists uh, from Hackers Makers Thinkers exhibition, all of them. And with them, we have critical minds from artistic research, curatorial practice, anthropology, architecture, design, and biology. Uh, for the audience, we've prepared uh, chat options on the YouTube live stream to leave comments or leave questions if you're following us virtually, and we'll collect and pick these up during the discussion. We want to wish everyone a great conference uh, with challenging ideas, fruitful conversations, and a great connection. Uh, we're here, we're very grateful for the opportunity to have this project, uh, and for that we've received uh, very generous funding from the Berlin Senate, and the Hauptstadt Kultur Funds, the German Capital City Fund. Uh, and uh, that has allowed us also to put together this conference, uh, as well as the group exhibition workshops and performances that make up the whole Hackers, Makers, Thinkers project. We thank our media partners, Art in Berlin and Klott Magazine. Uh, and we have special thanks to our co cooperation partners, Michelle Christensen and Florian Conrad from the Weizenbaum Institute of the UDK and the Einstein Center for Digital Future of the TU Berlin. We're grateful be, to be able to use uh, this location for the first conference day, uh, design transfer, uh, with the Berlin Open Lab next to it, and it, the beautiful garden in between. We, the curators, Regina, I, Tuja Errol, and Tengel Drillen, want to thank our team, uh, Julia, Nedia, Neda, and Claudia, for your great dedicated, breathtaking support in organizing logistics, realization, installing press and PR. And also special thanks to Pablo and Masha, our colleagues from Okaka. Uh, and again, especially today, Linus Kaufold to master the tech logistics during our conference. So a few words about the context of Hackers, Makers, Thinkers, or as Mackenzie Wark uh, wrote in 2004, to hack is to differ. So following two years of social distancing and isolation, Art Laboratory Berlin uh, will devote this year to exploring the social possibility, what social possibilities can be thawed and revived. Hackers, Makers, Thinkers proposes that doing it with others, D-I-W-O, can be a way of rebuilding and re-energizing damaged social relations. After a period when most of us have been reliant on corporate technologies, uh, Open source knowledge will be a form of basis for making and thinking. Above all, we're interested in an open culture based on reciprocity, cooperation, uh, and exchange on a global level, combining Berlin-based artists and venues with guest artists from Latin America and Southeast Asia. This project proposes art making as a tool for social empowerment and knowledge acquisition, collaboration, and working together. Hackers, Makers, Thinkers, co-curated by Regina Rapp, Tucha Errol, Tengel Drillin, and Christian Deluz, focuses and appropriates hacking as a curatorial research and methodology to unlearn institutional structures and reshape and hack in various mediums of artistic practices, such as workshops, performances, process-based exhibition, and conversations. The HI story of hacking and its patriarchal structures as well as, as its political, economic, and cultural connotations needs to be unpacked and addressed. Often the public associates hacking with the criminal, often hacking embodies masculinity and cyberbullying. 
However, through a feminist lens, hacking can be used as a tool set to critique the patriarchy, capitalist system, colonialism, and inequality of redistribution of resources. In reference to this large scale critique, the project addresses the value of citizen science, democratization of knowledge, community driven skill sharing, collectivism, and the collective mind hives. In Mackenzie Works, a hacker's manifesto, hacking is used as a methodology of abstraction and creating new things, which express relationships between art, science, philosophy, and culture. Hacking allows production and democratization of knowledge and technology beyond certain capitalist structures. Indonesian scholar and critic Grace Sambo proposes process-based artistic practice in contrast to conventional artwork production, which provides a different perspective of experience, knowledge, and scholarship and their ownership. How can we redistribute knowledge through thought, action, and exchange? And we also like to give a little introduction into the exhibited art projects, uh, which will be then also further explored here in the panels today and also tomorrow. So the core of the project is the group exhibition Hackers Makers Thinkers, which is featuring six art projects from artists from Latin America, Southeast Asia and Berlin. And um, I'm already here in one um, in front of one artwork. Since 2018, uh, Rice Brewing Sisters Club, RBSC, with Alicia Huin Yin Shin and Huy Min Son and So Yun Ryu, has combined artistic research with practice through a framework of social fermentation, which is also a very important basis for our curatorial project. Their projects encompass visual art, performance, creative writing, oral history, decolonial histories, geographical and geological observations, and anti-wisdom. Here in Berlin, Rice Brewing Sisters Club is working on a new installation, Terrestrial Celestial. That is a culturing home for microorganisms collected from rice, soil, and human microbiome. After multiple stages of growing, heating up, and mixing, the microorganisms will become nuruk, the Korean fermentation starter, and sekotumium, the Korean composting method that activates indigenous microorganisms. And we will find out much more in the panel to come right now. Accompanying the installation are workshops and social, micro, social microbial experiments that unfold throughout the exhibition period, which explore ways to be grounded in the earth we live in, while also traversing boundaries between micro migration, localization, and indigeneity. And we're very happy to host a workshop on the 4th of June here in Berlin. The project Entangled Beauty, a perfect marriage by Indonesian artist Irene Agrivina, combines traditional Indonesian farming practice, art and biology to create an installation that is also a power source. It brings together water fern plants with cyanobacteria. This mutual symbiosis of the two species, Asola and Anabena, creates a photosynthetic process that functions as a biofertilizer, water purifier, wood food for humans and non-humans, eco-friendly textile dyes and biofuel. The work also recalls the importance of cyanobacteria as Earth's original terraformer. The artist also carried out anthropological research about the connection between human culture and environment, drawing upon myths about the goddess of rice and fertility known in Java as Devi Sri, and we see her in the installation painted um, on the left image. The work Codex Virtualis by the Mexican Artist Collective Interspecifics is an AI art science research project oriented towards the image synthesis and evolution of an open-ended taxonomic collection of new to nature speculative life forms. It can be understood as an aesthetic journey through an ecosystem of neural networks and algorithms that reflects on the role, form, and association account for changes in the natural world. Codex Virtualis can be understood also as a ready-made of technology and theoretical frameworks that seek to sharpen our perception of the creative function in machine terms and questions conventional definitions of life, experimenting with algorithmic behaviors that progressively become novel life forms in themselves. 
Artist and designer Pei Ying Lin has developed a body of work over the years exploring the complex relationship between humans and viruses. The biological world is vast and evolving. As one of the biological habitants that share the same basic building blocks with other living and semi-living things, we are born within the cycle of evolutions. We share the same genetic codes as viruses. At the same time, not all viruses are pathogens. Virophila exists in various formats that we share here with the public. The artist book. The artist book. Cookbook for the 22nd century. And we find out much more in the, the next panel to come. Um, and we have the roles here, two large roles document a long list of viruses. And it also exists as a food performance, which we are very glad to have realized here with Peying Lin and uh, Ariel Ora from um, uh, Soy Division on the 11th of June here in Berlin. The installation Kipu by Chilean artist Constanza Piña Pardo recreates the ancient Inca Kipu textile pre-Hispanic devices for recording information made of cotton or camelite fiber strings that store data coded as knots. The artist added copper wires to 180 wool strings that are then connected to an electronic circuit that amplifies and sonifies the electromagnetic changes present at the installation site. Art Literature Berlin just hosted uh, uh, Constanza's workshop Kipu Dialogues a few days ago. The kipu can be under, uh, understood as a pre-Hispanic ecological computer. These computers were made with organic materials such as stones, wool, vegetables, vegetable fi fibers, um, ceramics, uh, seeds, even the human body itself is part of the computer system. Fingers, toes, and code, and the user's brain process the information. The importance of these computers lies in the transcendental, transcendental cosmic significance and the transmitted wisdom of the native peoples. Holobayont Relics from the Revolution is a science fiction musical installation and performance by artist Kamek Lindsay. That is an imaginary set inside a factory extracting toxins from cyanobacteria to transform them into profitable products. Roughly 2.5 billion years ago, cyanobacteria initiated the evolution of all complex organisms by introducing photosynthesis and oxygen into the atmosphere. The project speculates how cyanobacteria's toxicity and the anger of an intersection working class could band together to increase their power through symbiosis as a single ecological unit of life or holobiont. So just as a quick journey through our exhibition and also the speakers we are very happy to have here. Um, so we have uh, three panels today. Um, after the introduction right directly, we will start with the panel A, Hacking Food Narratives. We have then after the lunch break, Symbiotic elements and after a coffee break sonic cyborgs and the idea was basically to enlarge a sort of a classical setup that we are having here um, on the second conference day they're also inviting actually on the berlin audience to berlin in, to the art laboratory berlin's exhibition site to be involved in front of the artworks and to discuss the concept together with the artist's presence. So the first curatorial team, the first curatorial team tomorrow morning, um, the four of us uh, want to welcome you and the participants on site in the exhibition. And later, and that was actually an idea to activate our um, discussion today, uh, we invite conference participants to take part in the three, in three simultaneous so-called walk and talks with the conference speakers and the curatorial and conference team. So these walking conversations are intended to deepen the discussions that started on the first conference day. And by experience, we all, all know that the discussion time is always too short, so we extend it. And we want to invite to uh, think in motion and exchange in motion in smaller groups. And based on uh, Art Laboratory Berlin's experience of the positive impact and creative impulses of walk and talks, the three walking conversations will stimulate mind and body and offer an extended collective, what we could use to say, metabolism of knowledge.
beyond a classical conference format. Then we're also very happy to um, realize the workshop with Irene Agrivina tomorrow afternoon, soy couture equiprints on bio leather. And if you want, you can also still register for this. So thank you so much. So that was our introduction to the conference dates. And while we were clicking around with technology, I'm getting myself together and we actually can directly start already with pedal A. So welcome everybody to panel A, Hacking Food Narratives, and uh, we are back here at the conference. And um, yeah, the public thinks of food as the products coming from plants and animals, bought in the supermarket and cooked in the kitchen. We rarely think about the role of microorganisms, yeasts, bacteria, viruses in producing the food, drink, tastes, and textures of what we eat every day. Yet, these have always been a part of food production often, especially in fermentation, not only the production of alcohol, but cheeses, kimchi, kombucha, sauerkraut, you name it. These microbial processes have also, also been connected with collective or community interaction. And of course, all this is vital to our metabolism, both on an individual and a communal level. This communal process was ignored or neglected in the modern era. But just as we are rediscovering our own microbiome, we are recovering um, knowledges of these special spirits that inhabit our food and drink. So the artists we have here today will talk about and challenge the narratives Western society has created around food. And I'm very, very happy to uh, present our first speakers, um, artists involved in our exhibition, Hackers Makers Stinkers, the Rice Brewing Sisters Club with Alithea Huyun Yin Shin and Hui Min Son and So Yun Liu. Uh, you have combined artistic research uh, with practice through a framework of social fermentation. Um, your practice of social fermentation has been hopping between fields of visual art, performance, creative writing, oral history, the colonial histories, as already said, geographical, geological observations, and anti wisdom. In this presentation, you will detail our approaches to social fermentations as both a form and a method by bringing together the past projects, observations, and conservations and actions. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. Uh, yeah. So.
So hello, everyone. <laughs> um, we're very happy to open up this Hackers, Maker, Hackers Makers Thinkers Symposium. Um, uh, at the moment, uh, yeah, this one now. Okay, cool. Um, we are Rice Spring Sisters Club, a club artist and practitioner who have been working with the social fermentation uh, since our founding uh, in 2008, uh, I am Hemin Son. I am So Yun Ryu. Nice to meet you all. Alethea Hyunjin Shin. So three of us at the moment actively working in this club. And in this short talk, uh, we will first spend some time introducing how we have been conceiving social fermentation as a concept, as a method, as a form. And also we will spend the rest of the time with some reflection about um, the time we've been here in Berlin so far, uh, especially about our project, uh, Terrestrial Celestial, Celestial has emerged. Uh, it is an ongoing project and still in um, gestation. We will provide some episodic accounts through the lens of Sokko uh, Dungdung which is a descriptive word that we think nicely put together um, as artistic social process and also um, how social fermentation functions in this artwork. So what is social fermentation? You would be very wondering. Um, we're thinking of this uh, social fermentation um, two words, two concepts put together, the process of fermentation and also combining with this adjective social. I'm gonna just go, bit. yes. So let me begin with the fermentation first. The process that we are very familiar with. Fermentation is a series of chemical metabolic processes that decompose organic matter using enzymatic actions of microorganisms or bacteria to produce energy such as organic acids, gas, and alcohol, which I like most. Um, these processes have been coexisting, uh, interacting, and changing with the human beings for over 2,000 years, determining the taste and quality of almost all the food we eat here. When I think about uh, fermentation, uh, it reminds me of my grandma's house in Korea. There was a big pot in the corner of the house and she always kept that uh, big pot in, in the house. The pot was always covered with a blanket at the warmest corner of the floor and it's a full of sweet and sour smell and filled with the rice and water. So it, it's fermenting there um, ages. So whenever the blanket was uncovered, it revealed the magical moment, such a magical moment that um, transferring from something very sticky to wonderfully fragrant. Then maybe can we take a fermentation, a process in which a substance ripens to change in the different substances over time, beyond the boundaries of food culture, and imagine it as a social model, a way of life, and a nourish system. Let's think of these questions with the social layer of the social fermentation. Um, firstly, can process-based fermentation and its chemical activity become an agency of recognition, especially when a substance meets a new environment, then becomes a new dimension of its substance? Secondly, is it possible that Social fermentation addresses how hospitality and conviviality, in addition to the aspect of organic sharing and fermentation, can be extended to contaminate boundaries between microscopic, microscopic worlds and beyond. Lastly, can you ex explore how women's overlooked collective labor in fermentation is reframed in history, belief systems, um, and solidarity. With these questions um, in mind, I would like to ask two other sisters behind me 
to break down the concept of social fermentation individually and collectively. So. Um, so the concept of social fermentation for us, uh, we just kind of want to share our story. Um, the concept of fermentation for us is a metaphor and an art form and also a method. The social, social fermentation represents what each member brings to the table. And it also represents the clash of agreements, disagreements, and sometimes sparks of resonance when different worlds or beings meet. It also represents what we create and the trial and errors of us working together. Um, so far, our members comprise of, of interest of biological fermentation, anthropological research, um, and also social organizing as part of our backgrounds. Our interest contributes and takes role in our work and every project that we do. Um, so social fermentation is also a method for us. We choose to meet and we choose to do things with others. Uh, we actually partake in developing a network within ourselves and outside of ourselves. And this is partially because there are things that we don't know. And there are also things that um, we seek to understand. And this is great. Um, and artists, collectives, aunties, farmers, and scientists have been collaborators who held this experience and wisdom and insight um, through their choice of living practice and also in response to the environment they live in their given time. Um, so these are people that we want to work with and um, continue to ask for collaboration. Um, Non-human matters such as our senses, history, memories, systems, microorganisms, spirits, um, has also been active part partners in our work. And all this informs us in the making of our artistic modes of collaboration. And by doing so, I hope to say within the temporal relational space that we create in our projects that we seek to create a safe space and time to channel and unpack the social frameworks that we encounter. And in the context of the coloniality or feminism or ecological practice or the non-human or human discourse and more future conversations that are to come um, that we continue to do things ourselves and with, and with others to feel and know and what we might conti continue to explore and build um, as we continue to make work as a collective body. Thanks, Alethea. My thoughts resonate with the other two sisters, but I just want to add a note that um, there is indeed a material specificity that uh, the, this biochemical definitions like metabolic process and the chemical changes of the organic substrates and the actions of enzymes, all of these biochemical knowledge um, do take core parts of our practice of social fermentation. But at the same time, we're also thinking about the possibility of this process to expand its biochemical boundaries. And in this sense, I think our works might even test the limits in, in in a playful way, which we can think elastically between fact and national and irrational, institutional and vernacular. For instance, how elastic are the words like metabolic processes, organic changes, or enzymes in this case or in our works? These processes not only apply to the chemical knowledge of the organic matter we deal with, but also with other knowledge systems that we have thought that all of us might have thought as non-scientific and hence non-rational or even inclusive ways. So it is in the sense of what we call elasticity that we think of social fermentation as our core method. And by elasticity, we think about it as a method of breaking boundaries and hierarchies of value systems. And it is also in a way a political method or a belief that it is possible to create micro or macro, temporary or permanent forms of community once we break these boundaries. For one instance, dealing with social fermentation very, very often goes against the primacy of productivity or certainty that derive from our mostly anthropocentrist value systems because things take time to mature and we don't know when it's gonna mature. 
Um, it also involves a lot of contingencies and variances, including time, climate, humidity, mood, energy, and all of these decide the right balance between the sour and the dry, or the fermented and the decayed. But we don't exactly know um, how this is going to take place. So, of course, we do a lot of research, but we find that all, all of these re researches are not enough. Um, and overall, the state not knowing or not being able to know, yet knowing somehow with our bodies and feelings and senses, all of these processes determine a lot of our artistic practice. Um, so in an object that we see and exhibit at the ALB space, the object is not a finality in itself, and we're going to explain what we mean later. Um, it is rather kind of an open-ended circuit, that's how we perceive it, that continuously morph its forms and outcomes depending on where we are and who we work with, what kind of environment, um, social and climatic environment that we're in. And through this method of social fermentation, we believe that these uncertainties, uncertainties translate into a kind of elastic, elasticity. Um, lastly, I want to note that this open-endedness that social fermentation holds might turn it into a metaphor. And we actually have seen this thought from a very well-known book um, called Social uh, Fermentation as a Metaphor by Sandra Katz. But at the same time, throughout the three years that we have worked together and struggled together, we realize how fermentation, uh, when interpreted socially especially, um, is very far from being a literary device, but actually something that is very tangible and very material, even capitalistic. In other words, it is not only something that we conceptualize, but something that we do, hence doing social fermentation. And we've seen how fermentation in some cultures is directly related to lives and sustenance issues of food security and the economic sovereignty, especially through um, when seen through the feminist lens. Um, so starting from fermentation, we also end up engaging with the political economy because we consume, we make economic exchanges through it, we form interest groups, and we build industries built around fermentation. So it is our hope that our social fermentations practice can function as a method that is at once poetic and materialist. And it is with this vision that we approach our project in Berlin called Terrestrial Celestial. So on that note, we're gonna move in a little bit of picture of ourselves, Barbie. Um, we're gonna move on to the second part of our talk that kind of details the process of, of living in Berlin for a month, staying in Berlin and making work called Terrestrial Celestial, and the process which we call Sokko Dung Dung. Um, so the work here, you've seen the picture already from Regina's um, beautiful articulation, and it is a process-based work that is an installation that kind of functions as a culturing home for microbiomes that we raise. But it is also kind of a platform where a lot of performative actions and conversations, workshops, and cultivation of relationships, all of these unfold. Um, and it is definitely a work that um, kind of adapts across time because um, fermentation takes time and it ferments throughout the exhibition period until July 10th. So in this in the context of this talk, we thought it's best to kind of provide some episodic accounts um, surrounding this installation and how it came about rather than maybe giving a linear um, narrative of what this work is. So we're going to provide three episodes. Um, and I think Hemin will start us with one called So So Land. Yes, um, So So Land, um, Hukuk Land in Korean. Um, so we're traveling back to Korea. Uh, so in 2020 was the year that um, brought or brought the three of us all together in Korea um, in the same place, which is quite rare. Um, we often kind of communicating online, also working in a very uh, short sort of time or really focused time, like meeting and then working together. But that year was pandemic and uh, it's sort of like a stuck in a Korea and then like being year whole together. So it was the, um, we were in Ansong, which was the town um, of South Korea, uh, located a little bit of South to Seoul and it's considered of the major agriculture town of the metropolitan region. So it's um, 
I don't know whether we have. Yeah. So we set her in a very small size of uh, uh, land, I would say. Yeah. And started a project called Soy Soy Land, um, Cook Cook Land. Uh, was about experiencing a process of circulation uh, from germinating, growing, producing, consuming, composting, to taking and giving back to the land. So um, whole year, it was very hardcore learning for us with bare foot, bare, bare hands and feet all together for a year. And um, yes. Uh, basically, we are cultivating a land and uh, planting seeds and then learning different discourse from uh, different farmers and then scientists to, uh, to grow these uh, plants, which is like a native plants in uh, Ansong. So for a year, it was for us a learning process, um, very long-term learning process, uh, working with the land and soil. And then it's an opportunity to observe the soil uh, very closely, uh, which kind of learned um, for us, uh, learned many other uh, farmers and knowledge holders on where and how to plant the seeds, how to uh, tell certain plants from others, how to cultivate certain plants together, how to make compost. And it lets us um, uh, pay more attention to what indigeneity, um, tojong in Korean, meant to the land we live in. So that's uh, I'm just to show through a little bit of our working process here. But this is very closely um, connected to what we have been doing in Berlin at the moment. So um, I'm going to hand over to. The second episode. Sokka Dung Dung, Nuruk and Sokka Tiumbi. Regina already again explained beautifully what this is. But um, so this is so Nuruk is a Korean word uh, for fermentation starter or yeast. And Sokka Tiumbi is another Korean word that is a composting method using uh, what is called indigenous microorganisms or IMO. So the process of making both nuruk and sokkotiyumbi is actually really similar. Uh, we would make and sculpt a ball of rice using rice flour, let me see, like this. Um, and then we would just let it sit for a little bit, um, depending on the environment surrounding us, and let the microbes attach to um, the rice balls as mediums. And throughout the past three years, we have been researching and experimenting with this method, as Hemin explained, in Sabah of Malaysia, learning from Auntie Ita how to make, um, in this case, laru or ragi. And we've been conducting workshops of actually making duruk and developing into more of a cosmic, okay, sure, thank you, um, cosmic, more of a macro vision to fiction making and propagating memes. And here we're doing this experiment, but um, with attention to the process of how it's being made. And we call this because it involves a lot of mixing actions and stirring actions. And means stirring in Korean and means the action of floating. So we'll mix it together um, between different human agents, non-human agents, and let it sit, ferment for a period. And let the white microbiomes kind of attach to it over time. And then this is how the microbiomes flourish and cultured. And then we would put it in um, terracotta, which replaces um, the ongi, the Korean clay jar from, uh, from the Turkish market, and then let it ferment over time period. And with this process of mixing, letting it float, um, we mix microbiomes coming from various soils found throughout Berlin, um, many of which soil we don't know where it's coming from because of the histories of Berlin soil of mobility, localization, being having a lot of sand, therefore being donated soil from a lot of nonprofits and corporations. We're dealing with all these histories of mixing and floating. And we are doing this with a lot of people with migratory backgrounds um, coming from South Korea, Turkey, Mexico, many other places. So we're making 
this huge mix and of things that we don't know where it's coming from, where we're fermenting, experimenting, and seeing how it goes. So this process of kind of contingencies is something that we've been really enjoying here. We don't know how it's going to ferment after all. Um, we will open our first, first batch of microorganisms by the end of this week. Um, and we will make the second batch and kind of adapt the knowledge that we've learned in the past few weeks into the next generation. Okay, Alethea is going to quickly introduce the third episode. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then we've been doing this experiments in uh, many community gardens throughout Berlin, um, Tempelhofer Feld um, and garden colonies in Kreuzberg. Um, and also Neuken um, with many of the collaborators who are also here. Yeah, so that's what we've been up to. And thank you so much for listening to us. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Vice. Thank you very much, Rice Brewing Sisters, and we will uh, come back to your uh, amazing project uh, during the discussion. And I'd like to continue already to our next uh, wonderful speaker. We are so happy to have you here, Pei, Pei Ying Lin. I start already introducing Pei Ying. Um, so Pei Ying Lin is an artist and designer from Taiwan and currently based in Eindhoven, the Netherlands. Her main focus is on the combination of science and human society through artistic methods and is particularly interested in building a common discussion ground for different cultural perspectives regarding elements that construct our individual perception of the world. Payne, you have won the honorary mention in hybrid arts category of Ars Electronica in 2015, also the honorary mention of Starts Prize in 2020, so many um, prizes have been um, also before been taken, given over to Pei Ying, and also there is the um, professional runner up in speculative concepts, of course, of the seven awards in 2015, or the bio art and design awards. So um, awards for an amazing array uh, of uh, projects, interdisciplinary projects in art and science. And today, Pei, you will br tell, bring us into the world of a project that we have actually um, uh, been exhibiting at Art Laboratory Berlin, Virophilia. Thank you for being here. So thank you, Regina, for introduction and thank you for inviting me here. Um, it's actually been maybe two years that I haven't been standing in front of the people because of the pandemic. So I might be a little bit nervous. Uh, so I'm introducing the project of Virophilia here. But I will start with a little bit of uh, my trajectory or my journey with viruses. Um, I've been interested in the project uh, in viruses for a very long time. And here you see is one of the projects I did around 2011-ish. It's called smallpox syndrome. And it introduced, uh, interests me with viruses in the very beginning because a science fiction novel that was written by a Chinese author talking about smallpox being coming out again, where everyone was being affected, um, disregarding what their background is, how, what kind of economy standard they have. And then because of that, I start to study how I quite like this neutrality of viruses, that everyone is equal in front of virus. And so I start to explore all the notions that are related with it. And the first notion was hygiene and where hygiene is connected with beauty. So um, I was studying in RCA, Royal College of uh, Arts in uh, design interactions then, and we do a lot of speculative design, design fiction. So I was um, using the method of imagining um, what will happen if we play on the notion of beauty that if you're vaccinated, then you're considered more hygiene and more beautiful. So you will actually display the coat on the forehead or on the parts that you want as a makeup and it's also a vaccine at the same time. And I think I was estimating uh, around 2020, we will have a world that we've been affected by viruses so much that it becomes a big part of our life, which was fun. Um, and then in 2016, the virus, 
uh, journey continues. And this is a project that was uh, funded by the BAT Award, where I was collaborating with a philologist, uh, Miranda de Graaf. She uh, is studying um, this virus called norovirus that you probably all got it before. It makes you puke on diarrhea. And if you got infected, you get immunity for two years maximum, and then you will be affected again. The thing is, it's impossible or they haven't developed vaccines for it yet. So we propose that uh, we should try to tame them. And this notion of taming them is proposing that we need to live with them. And by living with them, uh, we don't have the ability to change the virus, so we have to change our behavior, which is a little bit funny to look at it now, since for the last two years. And with all these kind of um, exploration of viruses and because of this question uh, that was situated in art makes me understand more about viruses. And I get a little bit tired about looking at viruses in the pathogenic perspective. And so I start to look for other relationship that we have with viruses. This is the image of the tulip breaking virus. And it was being very famous in the 18th century in the Netherlands because with a tulip that has this kind of irrigation, you can buy a house and it's like so expensive. It's so expensive because nobody knows. We didn't have the idea of virus then. And they didn't know why it was causing this variegation. And it turns out that after the discovery of viruses that is caused by a virus, of course, there are other breeds that is being bred that genetically uh, creating this kind of um, variegation. But then, uh, back then it's only available if it's infected by viruses. Uh, also, there are another research, another art project called Plant Sex Consultancy. I also came across another example of um, viruses making benefit. So this is a uh, abutilon mosaic virus that gives variation, uh, variegation to the plant. And it was first, uh, so abutilon originally grows in South America, if I remember correctly. Around 19th century, there is this shipment of these abutilon plants that's very different from other abutilon plants that has variegation on their leaves. And it turns out that it's a virus. And these plants become very popular. They have a higher price. So as a result, plant virus seems to be very interesting in the sense that uh, if we are studying human viruses, that is also always pathogenic. But with plants, because maybe it's not so anthropocentric, uh, in a way we start to view it in other possibilities. So I reached out to this virologist, um, Rene van der Vloek. He works in Wageningen University on um, mostly plant viruses and specifically tobacco mosaic virus and other viruses. He was very friendly, uh, welcomed me to his lab, which is also a greenhouse. And so this is an image of the greenhouse. If you go in, you see lab coats, uh, just like any labs and greenhouses structure. But there's one image that caught my attention. Uh, it says, wash your hand first with soap, really hard and non-smokers. So it's a little bit weird. Why non-smokers? Because they are studying tobacco mosaic virus and tobacco mosaic virus affected tobacco. Tobacco is the thing that you make cigarette. As a result, um, occasionally you will have the leftover of the viruses on your hand if you're a smoker. So you are not allowed to enter the lab because you might be carrying the virus Another really interesting thing in the greenhouse is that we are very familiar with this thing now. It's an um, antigen test of plant viruses. And this one, I think, is pepinomosa virus, which is something that affects uh, tomatoes. Within the space, they are growing tomatoes. So they are constantly testing if the plants are being affected by the virus. If not, that, that means it's very clean and you can do experiments in it. It was also during the conversation with him that he mentioned about 90% of the plants, of the tomato plants in the Netherlands has been affected by a virus, but it was intentionally. Uh, it's used as a vaccine. 
So this is one of the example is a vaccine that's created by uh, DCM is based on papillomavirus. Um, one of the example being, this is another visit to the Lois farm. Lois is um, a farm that grows tasty tomatoes in the sense of like, if you look at the history of tomato growing, uh, to some point people were trying to grow them for the ease of transportation instead of focusing on the taste. So this farm, instead they focus on the taste and they use very high technology in growing the tomatoes. Uh, what happens is if you have a very large area growing tomatoes and because of the land is more expensive in the Netherlands, you have to control the environment to make sure that they don't catch disease. And they are also trying not to use the, um, the pesticide because it's bad for the whole um, ecosystem within the greenhouse that in the end you might actually need to spend more money to grow them. So they need to control a nice healthy ecosystem in there where they also use the um, vaccines that I just mentioned. So when the new plants come in, they will intentionally uh, inoculate the virus on the tomato. So the tomato will be already infected and they take time to adopt to the virus and they start to live with the virus. So all the tomatoes you see here has that virus. And also because um, the boss from the greenhouse mentioned that if you infect the virus uh, at the wrong time because the plant takes a while to adopt to the virus, uh, it will affect the yielding of the tomatoes. So you need to choose the right time, allow enough time for them to adopt to the virus so you can have the best yield. And that's why they have a very high percentage of viruses um, in the tomatoes in the Netherlands, because we think this is the most economy way of using the virus to grow the plants. Uh, I had one small experiment performance uh, in, in Vienna and where people were trying uh, different tomatoes from different places and I provided them with an uh, antigen, antigen test and they were discussing whether the tomato is tasty or not. And it was really funny, like some people are like the one that has viruses more. So all these experiences brought me to this virophilia book. It first started with uh, a future scene. So I try to position myself as the author in the future of 2068. The reason being that I have a, an allowance of uh, my imagination to imagine how the technology might uh, develop towards. So this is me as the fictional author writing, looking back at this history of how we develop new methodology of using viruses in cuisines, because that might change our mentality. And it's a uh, breakdown to five chapters that goes from around now-ish to around 40 years from now. The first chapter, goes about now is that people start to simulate the viral experiences. Can you have a food that makes you sick? For example, you can have an influenza simulation dish or a whole dinner where you can uh, breathe in the mucus arosal that hurts your throat, uh, a dog that makes you throat hurt as well, or with a lot of chili that makes your temperature heats up to experience the influenza. Uh, Another one is um, you can also have the image on the right is actually norovirus, uh, where norovirus, you catch it easily with eating the oyster, and then you can have the uh, certain dressing on top of it that makes your stomach ache a little bit, so you can enjoy the sickness. Uh, the second chapter is a bit more sophisticated. So we have fermentation. Fermentation usually works with bacteria because viruses is much harder that you have to grow the virus within a living host. And so I was thinking, of what if that is doable? Can we ferment? Because if you got infection from the virus, also change the texture or the structure of your organs and tissues. So can you ferment, for example, you want uh, 
neurovirus make intestine become more smooth? If you want more smooth intestine, can you uh, inoculate in a cow farm for the cows first uh, for a week and make sure that you kill the cow when he, it is still infected by the virus? And then you make sure that it's the right kind of virus that doesn't spread to human. Would that be possible? Or taking the example of some existing viruses that makes plants be more durable to drought. Can we also use that virus to make plants more durable to drought as a uh, result, making it more sweet because it can grow in um, drier space? The third chapter is using viruses as active ingredients, sort of like we are having vaccinations, you have a fever for a day, and these are oral vaccines where you can eat it. So on the left hand side, is influenza egg on rice, because most of the influenza or well, early research of influenza vaccines are grown in the chicken eggs. Uh, on the right hand side, is SM Brewery, where you do the brewery yourself, but you are also inoculating the virus at the same time when you're chewing. Um, then it becomes more sophisticated. Uh, I had one visit who also contribute a lot to this project. Uh, the scientist is called Corina Bussard. She is a researcher in marine biology. And she showed me her research of how do you tell if the algae are infected by viruses? It becomes transparent. So these are transparent because the algae are dead. These are in different colors because they have different status. And that gives me the inspiration of using the virus to um, control the, um, the color or the taste of a food because you can, um, viruses are good at selecting within a soup of things, infecting only their host and not affecting others. Uh, so for this one, you can change the color because the host is reacting to the virus throughout time. And so you can have a changing color drink, for example. The last one is about uh, 40 years from now, where we start to think very differently uh, how we uh, are within this ecosystem. So with the visit of uh, Karina Bussar's lab, she also mentioned that the strategy of algae becomes transparent by infected by the virus is that they will kill themselves. Um, so instead with COVID, we are trying really hard to make sure the individual who caught COVID doesn't die from that. But for algae, because they are single cellular organisms, it's comparatively cheap for them to just kill themselves and to protect the bigger community. That makes me think about how we value life very differently within uh, different species. So I was proposing that considering different species has different value of life, we can design dishes that everybody in the food chain can enjoy, but some got completely eaten. Some of us uh, in the food chain will provide something back into the food chain instead for others to join. It's quite sophisticated. And if you have time, then maybe you can read the story in the exhibition. Um, so it's also very difficult to uh, transmit this feeling of being sick. And so the project also exists in the video form where I have the actress eating the dish that has the virus. It's also existing as an installation, which I think the most important is the scroll behind because that's a growing list of viruses that we know uh, that has names, but COVID is not even on there because it's a subgroup of uh, SARS in there. and. It's been around 7,000 of them when I started the project, and now it's grown to 9,000. And it's estimated maybe only a 10% of all the viruses that we know. So, you know, there are a lot of possibilities. And it also exists as a demo performance. But during COVID time, we also do it with food delivery, where you can get the food, open it up, um, join the online meeting, where I tell them the story of the viruses while they're eating the food. And it also becomes a very interesting exploration because with all these dinner performances, I collaborate with different people, uh, chefs, people who are interested in cooking and develop the dishes for them. And this is the image of a collaboration I had with a tea house in Japan, which actually throughout the process, we discovered that the albino tea, the white tea, uh, a special kind, is 
probably also affected by the virus. And that brings a very mild, nice of taste. And we were also trying to integrate the idea of if it's being affected by virus, can we have like two different kinds of taste of the poor? Or can we have um, an alcohol contained tea as a way of sanitize ourselves? And that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, uh, Peijing, um, for your um, fascinating presentation. And I want to move on to our third um, talk, to our third speaker, who we are absolutely mind blown to have not only in the conference, but here in person in Berlin. Uh, Oron, Oron Katz is with us here today and tomorrow in the Today Conference. And um, welcome, Oron. And uh, before his presentation, let me just quickly introduce, for those who do not know, Oron. And uh, we can say that we have here different generations of um, uh, artists um, working with uh, life, art, and uh, life. And I think Oron is a very important artist here. So just to give a general introduction, Oren Katz uh, is the co-founder and director of Symbiotica, the Center um, of Excellence in Biological Arts School of Human Sciences at the University of Western Australia, Perth. Symbiotica was awarded the inaugura inaugural Golden Nika for hybrid arts in the Prix Ars Electronica in 2007 and the WA Premier's Award in 2008. Together with Jonat Sur, uh, Oron founded the Tissue Culture and Art Project in 1996. Katz was a professor at large in contestable design at the Royal College for the Arts in London and a visiting scholar at the Department of Art and History, Stanford University, and a visiting professor at the School of Art, Design and Architecture at Alto University in Helsinki, and many, many other projects and uh, involvements. Um, we could continue the line. Um, let me also just uh, say that um, Oron curated 13 exhibitions, published, co-edited four books, published more than 80 book chapters and journal articles, and um, your work Oron featured an exhibition in venues such as MoMA in New York, Centre Pompidou, Mori Art Museum, and Science Gallery London, to only name a very, very few. So um, Oron, the stage is yours, and you will um, tell us today a few ideas in context of nature-free agriculture, hacking, and contesting future food systems. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Um, Thank you, Regina. Thank you, Chris, and everyone else who's responsible for having me for this short visit. It it's, was a dream of mine to come to Berlin and see what you're doing for many, many years. So it finally happened post-pandemic. So it's great fun to be here. Um, I will give you some provocations. Those of you who know me know that I'm a provocateur. So you, know, you don't have to take me too seriously, but uh, hopefully you'll get some points uh, from what I have to say. Uh, but before I start, I really would like to acknowledge the Wajak people who are the traditional custodians uh, of the land from which I live and work, which is Perth, Western Australia, or the Balu on the Dabal Yarragan. Um, and I would like to acknowledge their strength and their continuing culture and pay my respect to elders past and present. And actually, in the context of what I have to tell you, in the context of what we heard before, this type of uh, traditional knowledge is becoming, in my opinion, more and more important, especially when we're dealing with food systems. And uh, I, I would like to acknowledge that, and I would like to acknowledge that some of the stuff I'm going to tell you today is inspired to, to a large extent from conversations I had with uh, some aunties and some traditional owners uh, in Western Australia. Um, I never thought that I'll be dealing with food systems, I must say. I, I, I grew up in a farm, and that really took me off food systems from quite some time. Uh, but uh, back in the year 2000, Yonat Zur and myself have been growing meat in the lab. And the reason why we've done that wasn't so much that we wanted to feed the world or deal with ethical issues around uh, the reduction of the use of uh, animals in food production. 
But because our interest was always about how our relationship to the concept and the idea of life is changing and shifting, light of the new knowledge that we acquire through science and the new way we employ this knowledge through engineering. And we realized that one cannot get more intimate with another life form than consuming it and metabolizing it and introducing it into one's own body. Yeah? So the idea of growing meat in the lab made a lot of sense for us from this perspective. The idea of what does it mean to engage with life that never been in a body? What does it mean to incorporate meat that never was part of an animal body was what drove us to grow our first piece of meat back in the year 2000 and eat our first piece of lab grown meat back in 2003. Now we have to remember that the idea of being able to use and engage with living biological materials, especially around food systems is as um, Jonathan Safran Foer reminds us, we treat nature as an obstacle to be overcome. And, and I would claim that any attempt to work with the living biological material for human ends, be it a very romantic idea of collaborating with other organisms or the very uh, industrial notion of uh, farming, they're all degrees of violence that we exercise in our attempts to control and treat nature as an obstacle. Yeah? So it's not, it's not warm and fuzzy. It is a, a, a relationship of uh, adversarial relationship between us and the living world around us. Uh, and it's just the choice we have to make is the degree of violence that we're willing to exercise towards other living beings, not whether we collaborate and love them or not. Uh, provocation. Um, the idea of growing meat in the lab really exploded in the last few years. Uh, there's a growing number of companies, startup companies around the world that are promising us this future of uh, abundance without consequences. Uh, one of the main companies is a company called uh, Just Eat. And they are the first company in the world that was able to get uh, uh, governmental approval to sell lab-grown meat in Singapore a couple of years ago. And this is from the website uh, that promotes what they refer to as good meat, their product that is now being sold in Singapore. And there's something quite interesting about the way they're telling us their story. So this is, it's like one of those infinite scroll uh, websites. So you start to scroll and you see this uh, image, which is uh, basically an electron micrograph of uh, what's supposed to be meat and says, there's nothing natural about the meat we're putting into our bodies now, which I agree with. Then they have this image, which is under the animal uh, health uh, section of the website, where they say how we manufacture animals and treat them as commodities is new and unnatural. And again, this is a point that I think we all have to uh, take on board. But then you go down to their product, and they're saying here, this is good meat, engineering and natural and innovative process to grow meat for the world. This is the new nature that they're proposing. This is the natural solution that those companies are trying to promote. Another company called Air Protein, they're claiming that they're creating meat from air. And they're talking about the fact that we need a new way of thinking about how we grow meat, how we, how we feed ourselves. And the whole proposal is that it's somehow magically we can generate meat from nothing, meat from air. Actually, what they're doing, if you look really deep into it, they're actually using bacterial fermentation to ferment proteins. But they somehow figured out that bacteria don't really have a good uh, reputation, so they would sell us the fantasy of meat from air. Luftgeschäft, no? Is that how you say in German? Yeah, that's the thing. So we decided to respond to it. One of the very latest projects that uh, Yonat Zur and myself, in collaboration with uh, Steve Barrick, uh, head in Perth uh, earlier this year is a project which is called 3SDC, which is, stands for Sunlight, Soil and Sheet Decycling. And the idea there is to look at the way contemporary ag tech and uh, those food systems are promising us a future where we'll live without those basic ingredients, which are sunlight, soil and sheet. Or in other words, what they call controlled environment agriculture, and we've seen a little bit uh, uh, this type of controlled environments that are being promoted as a new sustainable way of uh, providing us with food. So in our system, we basically had a compost incubator. So we designed an incubator to grow uh, animal cells, so basically lab-grown meat, but the heat was generated through a rotting process, basically a fermentation of sorts, of uh, uh, composting uh, uh, this 
wood chip that generated a steady temperature that allows us to grow meat in the lab, in the farm actually, uh, but uh, using only fragments of bodies. Um, the meat was then, and because it's a cycle, you can start everywhere you want. Uh, here you see on the side also a, a hydroponic system um, that was used to grow uh, plants that wasn't used for food, but were used to feed the compost to heat the meat that was then being processed using a, a technique which is called alkaline hydrolysis uh, that is now being promoted as a form of environmental cremation um, to produce the fertilizer to grow the plants in the hydroponic system to uh, basically for the uh, compost that was then was hitting the meats or incubating the meat cells that were then used as the uh, starting point for the alkaline hydrolysis and so it went. So it was basically a, a, a useless cycle because obviously there was nothing there for human consumption. And on top of that, we had what we refer to as the control center. Steve Berek, our collaborator, is an amazing artist that uh, deals with um, sensors and technology. And we basically uh, developed a range of sensors that provided us large amount of useless data. And, and just before I came here, I went to one of the most neoliberal conferences one can imagine, the DLD conference in Munich. And there was a whole panel about uh, those control um, agricultural environments. And one of the things that really struck me, and you know, we thought we we're doing a satire here about this, uh, creating shitloads of data that no one really needs, but as a way of kind of promoting this whole idea of those new technologies. And one of the speakers in this DLD conference was talking about the fact that we need to think about data as a new food ingredient. This is how fucked up things are. Yeah. So in the name of sustainability, many new food production and agricultural ventures such as vertical farming or cellular agriculture propose a system that removes natural elements from the process of production. The idea of soilless farming techniques or animal products without animals are presented as having less or in many cases as no impact on the environment. This is something we call metabolic rift technologies. So metabolic rift technologies are a prime example of the Prometheanism uh, approach that favors extractive approaches over instructive methodologies of production. Metabolic rift technologies call for separation from nature following a very similar mindset to uh, where am I? Yep, following a similar mindset that leads to tech companies uh, to promote the metaverse, for example, as a nature-free site for human habitation, obscuring the environmental cost of such an existence. So what all of those technologies are doing, and this is the idea behind the metabolic rift technologies, is that we somehow would like to believe that we can use technology to separate human existence from nature. So not just treat nature as an obstacle to be overcome, but totally separate our, our existence for, from nature itself uh, in the name of sustainability, and by doing so, somehow uh, dig ourselves up, out of the mess we're in. Uh, but what they're actually doing, and this is what the metaverse, for example, is doing as well, is just creating this illusion that we have no impact on the world around us. It's separating us, it's obscuring, it's hiding the victims of our existence, it's not eliminating them. Uh, so, and, and when you think about it in the context of where we are now, so in the Industrial Revolution, one of the major outcomes of that was the separation of sentiency from labor. Yeah, so the idea was to create machines that are non-sentient in order to allow us to uh, be able to produce more and more and uh, generate this industrial revolution that uh, led us to the kind of existence we have now. Uh, and by basically removing biological agents, yeah, so workers, slaves, so slaves or uh, working animals and replacing them with those non-sentient machines. In the so-called fourth industrial revolution, which is what is being promoted at the moment, and in many cases, actually, even the best intentions of artists that are trying to deal with those issues, we are part of that very same mindset. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution promised to bring sentiency to the machine through things like artificial intelligence. And again, conference after conference I've been to lately are talking about this idea of bringing sentiency to machines through AI and autonomous systems. Another panel in the DLD was about uh, the creation of of autonomous enterprises. So basically having companies that are running by AI that have their own sentiency. So if we think about corporations as persons, now they're talking about corporations as aware sentient persons that would control us. At the very same time, we're trying to remove sentiency from biological entities through biotechnology and synthetic biology in the name of increasing productivity and efficiency. 
and, and this is a slide from a recent TED talk by Isha Datar, who's uh, the CEO of a company called uh, New Harvest, which is one of the biggest non-profit organizations that promote this idea of uh, uh, growing animal products without animals. And what she says there when she talks about the idea of growing chicken meat in the lab, she says, rather than raising the whole chicken with those useless things like beaks and feathers and sentiency, we can just grow the muscle cells. So when we reach a situation where humans are talking about removing sentiency for biological systems for human ends, for human uh, uh, desires and wants, what kind of world we are going to live in? If we think about the major shifts in the idea of the removal of sentiency from labor with the industrial revolution, where it leads us, and now we think about the removal of sentiency from biological systems, while at the very same time we give sentiency to non-biological systems, what kind of world we're we going to live in? So as an artist, I think this is one of the most interesting questions uh, that we need to deal with. And we need to deal with uh, now. It's, it's an urgent question because those, as I said, with the combination of that and the metabolic rift technology and the metabolic rift mindset, the idea is that this is somehow promising as a solutionist approach towards the problems we're in, at the very same time that it's doing nothing but hiding the real problems that we're facing. And just one little example. Um, this is a paper that was published just uh, last year by MIT engineers who were talking about the idea of being able to grow wood in the lab. So it's not just growing meat, it's not growing milk in the lab. It's now also proposing to grow things like wood in the lab. And in there, they're talking about why do you need to grow the whole tree uh, that has all of those unwanted or unusable plants, parts of plants anatomy, such as bark, little twigs, roots, and leaves. So how are you going to feed it? What's going to feed those, this lab-grown meat? If you don't have leaves and roots, which are useless, like sentiency, which is useless, that we need to throw away, what kind of world we live in where people can actually seriously propose those kind of things? like the air protein, like somehow we can grow air from uh, meat from the air. So this fetish of technological approaches to life often overshadows the life, the context in which life operates itself. Yeah? Uh, we call it neolifeism. So and I myself are, are working a lot on this idea of the fetishization of those technological approaches to life. So it seems that the biological milieu is transformed into an abstract technological instrument of control where life is just another raw material to be engineered. Decontextualized life has been reconfigured, mixed and remixed, re reappropriated and instrumentalized to such an extent that the technologically imagined, and remember that this is the imagined idea about life stands for life itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oron. Um, I'd like to invite all the speakers here to the podium to have a, to start our conversation. And we have about half an hour. This is really perfect. And uh, also we try to um, later on open up the forum to questions from the audience. And actually, if we have time also to even um, come back to the questions of the online forum if we find the time. Um, so thank you very much, all speakers um, uh, here of the panel, um, Hacking Food Narratives. And I see here as, uh, as varied the approaches are, as varied also yeah, our generations are here and, and, the, and the approach to uh, working uh, with uh, living systems. I see here uh, a common red thread about a, a, a really deep reflection of all of you, how we can, uh, um, give uh, justice to uh, non-human organisms and actually microbi micro the, the phenomenon of the microorganisms and the powerful uh, uh, role that they play and actually the, uh, 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 st uh, humans stepping back of the superpower, uh, seemingly superpower and influence that we can have and produce and coming actually now from the big criticism that we heard from Oron's talk uh, upon uh, the fetishization of biotechnology and the seemingly uh, superpower of what humans have to, to grow meat out of everything. And the, uh, what I find very interesting, uh, the, the high big cr criticism of metabolic rift technologies 
and the fetishization and uh, also we in a while, I, I will go back to the Rice Brewing Sisters who have some questions and I'll come back to you, uh, Oren, also about the, the fascination of the meta level of satire, what you this, this set up the installation that is probably was maybe not understood by all the audiences. And then I see also the, um, um, the, the, the realm and the whole world that you pay embraced, uh, as you told us in your talk today, about, um, I could even call it viral performances, that all these years of artistic research in the different projects that you have been showing us and actually making and made way more projects, uh, that uh, there is actually, it seems the virus has gotten the role of a cyberpunk character, basically, and you actually play along with this. And I also come back to a question to you, but I actually would like to come back to our first speakers here, uh, to the Brewing sisters, and also thank you for the whole journey the, uh, in, our, in, the, in our quite short panel today that you uh, took us to a journey also to show us the garden that you built up in South Korea. And we probably are all now curious to visit at some point. Uh, and um, I also found it interesting um, uh, dear sisters, when we can reflect upon your presentation, metabolic processes, and I found this very interesting. I think it concerns uh, you all speakers here in our panel, eh? um, the awareness of metabolic processes. And I, I saw that, that you would like to read it uh, directly biological and then also metaphorical metabolism. And uh, Soko Dung Dung coming to talk about the Berlin project. Maybe you can actually uh, give us more of an insight now. Um, I feel that I, I recall and I, I, it was echoing this fermenting feminist approach by Lauren Fournier. And I think you probably go very much into the direction of um, fermenting feminism as methodology and a metaphor. Uh, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I heard a lot of for Lauren Fournier's proposition that fermentation is a generative metaphor, a material practice and a microbiological process through which feminism might be re-energized. And I heard you well when you also said in the end of your talk, it's about female labor and it's also about um, feminist, uh, feminine role and uh, feminist roles. I found this very interesting, this uh, melding. And of course the mixing and I noted elasticity. I think this is a term that all your artistic practice with the Berlin project, but maybe also with the general artistic practice that you are, uh, um, um, that you're expressing and living is the this term I found very interesting as a method, elasticity. So maybe do you want to maybe go a little bit more into this metabolic process, maybe in perspective of uh, the Berlin terrestrial celestial project? Yeah. And if yeah. you would be so kind to come here to our camera that we can actually embrace. Oh, well, you can use that microphone, wonderful, okay. Loaded question, Regine. Thank you. <laughs> I think all three of us can can kind of offer yeah. something. Um, okay. Come to me. Why don't you just join me here? We have the camera, we have the audience. So maybe I just hand over whoever wants to speak. <laughs> Sorry about the loaded question. I basically only wanted to find uh, sort of a way in to actually continue talking about your Berlin project. I can start and I think maybe the other two sisters can can help me. Um, yeah, so there, there's a lot of layers, right? How we think of social fermentation as a way of decentering from humanist or anthropocentrist thought and how to pay attention to the microbiomic world. That was one layer. Um, another is fermentation or social fermentation as a feminist practice. Um, another being um, how we kind of incorporate this into a mode of elasticity um, and then in relation to the project in Berlin. So I, th I think we can kind of approach this question in multiple ways, but, but I can start with um, elasticity <laughs> because I think I brought this word up. Um, 
it is it, it in a way um i think our practice let me start this way i think our practice does focus on microbiomic world fermentation as a biochemical process but as much as we're interested in the non-human world we're also interested in the human world because they because both worlds inevitably have to interact um one world can exploit another another world can be exploited by another but um it is it is inevitably the two worlds that um, our practices speak to. And I think that's where the elasticity comes to because the so the, you might have seen that the social fermentation, that word um, reverberates differently to each member of the collective. So that there is a layer of kind of more human-centered, like discourse, conversations, struggles, fights, doing together that comes into um, the practice that we eventually create as a collective. So um how to approach the social fermentation i thought we thought that okay it is it comes from multiple scales it comes from multiple humans we deal with multiple microorganisms that some of which we just don't know where they come from we don't know if we're going to succeed in fermentation we're really uncertain about this but how can we think of this as not being uncertain but being open-ended and kind of really living life in that moment of uncertainty and open-endedness. So, so I think that's, that's where, where um, um, the term, the term elasticity, elasticity comes, comes in, in um, at, least, at least in my, in my mind. mind. I, would I would be interested, be interested in hearing the other two sisters' thoughts too. Um, and then in, in this, I think this, this, this really, really directly, directly ties, ties into, into the project, the project in Berlin, 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 especially in Berlin, because it's our first time um, doing projects in Europe or Western Europe. And we encounter a lot of differences, and I would say very charged differences, historical, racial, ethnic, gender differences um, working here. And um, the, how, how we incorporated this kind of uncertainty into our practice, and eventually we ended up doing it without really knowing in advance what's gonna happen, is um, how we frame this um, fermentation process, especially coming from native practices in South Korea, into something that builds resonance with the city that we staring, we were staying in and all of you are staying here. Um, and how we um, kind of thrive in this moment where we don't know what's gonna happen because we use different ingredients, we use different terracottas, we don't know who you're collaborating with, where they come from. We only have certain level of collaboration and just being, being here for a month. Um, so a lot of it remains open-ended and I think I, I feel good about that. <laughs> um, just, just watching what happens and um, how it unfolds. And I think that's why we are kind of not speaking about our work in the kind of a finalizing um, in a very linear way. Um, yeah, I hope that explains. Um, uh, just want to point out that um, when we we traveled a lot, um, we traveled to Southeast Asia mostly um, before pandemic. So we went to Taiwan or Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Philippines. Uh, we stayed there for a month at least and tried to learn um, how to make uh, nuruk, like a uh, yeast, and also how to make a rice wine. So basically, whenever when when you have a rice or crops, then they are making alcohol with this kind of crop. So when we uh, visited um, certain area and a certain rice field, uh, we always met aunties, daughters, and uh, sisters. Um, I don't know why, but probably it makes sense that um, they have the knowledge that how to make uh, rice wine. So they travel, they, they pass on the secrets to their daughters and then sisters. So the Nari is kind of kept in their kind of sister, sisterhood. And we find it that's very uh, precious. And also that's really hidden and also being forgotten in Asian culture. And I think uh, we, we think um, we try to learn from aunties how they make a uh, rice wine, uh, whilst we are learning it, they told us a lot of story about their life. And then they told a lot about um, belief system when they are making rice wine, which is quite poetic, but at the same time, very scientific as well. First of all, like don't touch any acid, um, acid acidic um, 
uh, fruits like lemon. So before before making rice wine, um, try not to think of very uh, unpositive thinking. Um, be very nice to 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 your rice wine when you're making. So there are a lot of uh, belief system that is not really proven or maybe that it is kind of overlooked, which we find it very important. And we like to have that uh, culture and have that stories into our social fermentation practice. Maybe that's the one way we can think of as a feminist lens to our practice. Yeah. Three of us. <laughs> Uh, we don't have to we don't have to always talk in three but um i'll just do very shortly in terms of metabolizing things um i think we um especially for this project it was really part of it was kind of us metabolizing this concept of indigeneity and this act of rice balls and mixing our organism to this yeast form and then putting it to the soil was also sort of a way of us sharing our germs and organisms to with the soil and i think that practice in a way is sort of an act of localizing in some way and we thought it was interesting to share that with people who have migrated to berlin and we wanted to share their stories and learn about their stories about how they um, adjusted to berlin and how their gardening practice has affected the way um, with the seeds that they brought and how they adjusted to the soil and the climate here. Um, so we thought the fermentation practice and the social narratives um, and the people's choices and stories that come with it. Um, and in that way also we're planting memories, we're planting plants, we're eating food from it. Um, and we kind of want to bring a circle around that um, elements. So I think that's what we were trying to do. Thank you. And with these um, meldings, I have a question to you, Pei Ying. So also this, the idea of melding and let the virus do its thing, and that you said you came from interest of uh, pathogens, but then you actually wanted to move on, which I find very interesting. But then all it's all, as I said already, I have this feeling, it seems like the the virus got the role basically of a cyberpunk character and that in many different projects that you actually let the viral perform, which is also an interesting idea of autonomy as again, as a human um, unit steps back. And um, also the ecosystem of uh, cuisine. And uh, so, so actually, is it, exactly this pathogenic character associated with viruses that makes it so seductive for you to use combining danger and fear of disease and death with food, beauty, and pleasure? Well, actually, not that much. Maybe in the beginning, in the very, very beginning, like about 10 years ago, that was what attracts me. But gradually, as you mentioned, it has a role. Uh, virus becomes sort of like a mirror and in the mirror in the sense of like we are looking at the viruses and reflecting on ourselves but i think this has uh two traditions maybe in on my on me because i studied design where we look at objects uh, as artifacts and where artifacts create the world and influence ourselves on the on reverse but also my asian culture which in the Chinese philosophy, it has a lot of things where you look at things and then you think about yourselves and you ponder on the same idea again and again and again, and then you discover some truth underneath it. So it's more focusing on that process instead of the definition of the thing. So I think virus, because it's so integrated with our life, that like even with now, here, right now on me, I must have some viruses on me. So this integration seems everything exists, every biological thing exists, it's always there. So it, it has a very rich element that we can ponder on. So it becomes a very nice subject. Yeah. Again, the awareness how much virus is, is in us. We are the virus, actually. And coming with this um, metabolic uh, change, actually, to, to you, Aaron, um, 
so actually, yeah, we, we, we live really in this age of soil crisis and, uh, and this mass soil degradation and the, the tandem with climate change and the threat to agricultural norms. So you were pointing out all these, these uh, wannabe projects from biotech companies that actually, uh, and then the sentience, the, 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 this, I think this shift was so important that you said, and we feel this with the biosophy with, in context of the um, discourse of post-anthropocentric uh, um, discussions that we have led at Art Literature for all these last few years, that uh, giving sentience to non-humans, how much we can learn that. And then you actually here counter um, pr present or you actually you, you dissect these uh, biotech biotech projects, right? That that promise the world, but then again that um, that sentience the biological sen um, systems instead of giving tribute to non-human sentience and, uh, and agency. Um, actually, I, I would be curious, Oron, if you could go um, and, um, and share with us more this, this, the, the life of the work 3SDC and also actually the, the, the audience feedback and actually how, how, how this actually interacted all in all. I'm really, really curious because there's so much irony and satire in it actually. How, what's, what's the reaction to it? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you to, for giving me the opportunity to talk more about that project because it was a very interesting project. We, we from my perspective, obviously, uh, we, we framed it as a durational performative experiment. So very similar to the approach that you're taking. We had workshops there. We had uh, two dinners that uh, we organized with uh, a local chef that specialize in indigenous food in Australia. And, and the brief I gave to the chef was, uh, cook us something that uh, the contemporary agriculture and, more, and kind of future ag tech is trying to make us live without. Yeah, so food that is growing in soil, <laughs> being kind of a, a bath by the sun and uh, is kind of uh, running in shit. Uh, but also, in a sense, food that is wild, that is seasonal, that is foraged, the kind of non-standardized food that nature is providing us as opposed to uh, this uh, technological approach. And he did an amazing dinner. It was, we, we had two dinners of about 50 participants each. It was unbelievably tasty, but it cost $200 a person. So when I invited the people and the people who paid this money to come in, I, we had like a conversation to start with and I said, okay, you know, on the one hand, this new agriculture is trying to promise uh, or is promising to feed the world, which I don't think it's going to happen cheaply and sustainably, which I, again, I don't think it's going to happen, but the alternative is what you are going to consume now, but it costs you $200 each to eat it. So it's only privileged people can enjoy kind of the fruits of uninterrupted nature in this context. So we are in a problem and, and I wanted them to the way I presented it, I said like, okay, enjoy your food, but feel guilty while doing so. Because the other thing is that those new technologies are basically trying to create this notion of a guilt-free existence while we're consuming the world around us. So as long as we at least informed about the hypocrisy of us being in the world, it's one step towards trying to figure out where we're going. Yeah, so this idea of informed hypocrisy, I think is extremely important. And it seems that the people obviously enjoy the food very much and enjoy the idea of feeling guilty while eating the food. There's like this French, very French thing, I think, that we were able to import to Australia. Um, but the other thing that we, we worked with a, a graphic designer, we designed the whole uh, exhibition in such a way that it would appear as if it's a, a serious tech uh, uh, operation, even though we had the, the compost and we had all of the other things. And, and, and if you look closely, you realize it's a it's a useless cycle rather than it's going to do anything good in the world. And for the didactic panels for the works, what we did was to basically copy paste from those companies and then just try and push it a bit more further that people would recognize that it's a satire. But especially after being in DLD, I realized that we didn't even push it far enough. Those companies are a satire of themselves and raising millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in venture capital money by telling us those ridiculous stories and venture capitalists love that seductive narrative that comes through. So yeah, we, yet again, we failed. And, and I sent an engineer, actually an environmental engineer, which I knew I sent him on a mission, said, okay, have a look around the show and tell me where we got it wrong. And I wanted him to pick up all of those problems and, and pick up where we kind of really pushed it and there's no way those promises are actually going to be fulfilled. And the only thing he could come up 
back to me was, he said, how did you manage to get uh, such sponsorship from this 3SDC company? He was just so captured by the fact that we designed a logo that looked like a logo of a company that he couldn't even think about anything else. And he again, thought that it's real. And then I had two visitors. One was um, looking after golf uh, lawns in Australia, in Perth, which is one of the worst environmental polluters in, of the river uh, uh, in Perth. And uh, his partner, who was uh, an environmental scientist working for mining companies in re remediation of mining. And, and they were like the most amazingly thick people in the sense of not being able to, again, see the satire and understand the issues that they are supposed to be the people who actually should be in the know. This guy didn't even know how much pollution his lawn is producing and how, how many kind of algae blooms we have in the river because of the type of stuff, because of people want to play golf. Yeah, it's, it's not even something that, and the, the one about the environmental remediation, she, she had no clue about the, the soil biome. You know, what kind of environmental remediation you can do in mining if you can't re rebuild the soil with the biome inside it and then claiming. So they're all kind of greenwashing and, and they left the show saying, best of luck, you know, hopefully you'll be able to commercialize your ideas. You know, that's kind of the world we live in. We're, we're totally fucked. <laughs> well, you leave this actually uh, to, to me here. Uh, okay, uh, it's, it's the conundrum of the world we're living. So we have maybe a comment uh, questions from the audience. Yeah, does anybody want to ask a question from the audience first before we look online? Uh, maybe if you could, Best is you can come up here and ask. Uh, okay, so Mara. All right, yeah. What's, yeah. Uh, now we have just a quick question. I was thinking to ask uh, Oren, in terms of why do we not want to eat animals? Is it really about the sentience? And my question is also related a little bit about science fiction because I'm very interested lately how do we construct narratives and then how do we construct realities in art and biology? And there's like this story about Philip K. Dick uh, that, uh, about the wolf and he gains like his conscience, he has sentience even, and then they eat him anyway, right? So we're discussing what's the reason why we eat or not eat someone. And I was also thinking in terms of science fiction of Margaret Atwood and Oryx and Craig, and they also have like these chicken breast creatures, you know, and then the things that you told us today, like we extract the parts that are not necessary from this. So I was thinking in terms of science fiction, but also in terms of why do we eat or do we want to eat creatures? All right, yeah, thanks for that. And obviously, you know, the idea of growing meat in the lab is a, a, a very kind of important trope in science fiction. There's a space merchant from the late 50s as well, talking about the little chicken, which is this big chunk of chicken meat that they keep on cutting. Uh, so, so I think there's a couple of things with the narrative around lab grown meat and growing animal products without animals. Uh, one is the idea of creating a, this guilt-free existence. And, and there's a really interesting philosophical critique about it because it's not solving the problem of how we relate to the world. If we create those technological solutions for those ethical issues, we're actually enhancing those ethical issues. We, we're not allowing, we, we're basically, you know, it's another form of a metabolic rift of the sense of the contract that we have with life around us. Um, we had a project back in the early 2000s called the DIY Devictimizer Kit, and that was to do with uh, something we noticed in Spain. And this is kind of a little story, but I think it tells a lot, um, that what we noticed in Spain is that as the amount of McDonald's increased in Spain, so did the resistance to bullfighting. So this idea of replacing this very small scale, ritualistic and respectful, but very violent uh, relationship to uh, bovine, to cattle uh, in bullfighting with the much more large scale, massive, but totally obscured and implicit violence of, you know, fast food burgers. This is how our culture is moving towards because it's not about the removal of the victim, it's the removal of our perception of our vision of the victim from in front of us. So when you grow meat in the lab, you still use animal products. Uh, you still use fetal calf serum, but even if you get rid of it, there's so many other ingredients. And this is one of the things that those narratives are telling us. It's as if the lab and science and technology is kind of the, ma the magic of the 21st century where we can get something from nothing. So that's why I think the air protein is such a nice idea of, of 
the type of stories that are being told to us at the moment. And this idea that, you know, we can claim that bacteria is not sentient, but they're trying to hide the bacteria from, our, uh, from that story just to give us this amazing narrative of manna from heaven, of somehow science brings us food from nowhere. And um, at the very same time, yeah, we, we are kind of trying to push this idea of removing the sentiency from animals, but they're also that's not the top story. That's, I was really happy to see it from in the talk, in the TED talk that Isha gave, because usually they don't even talk about it, even though it's implied. They talk about kind of the environmental consequences. And again, this idea that somehow we can create our existence totally separated from nature. And this is kind of the, the metabolic rift technology that is being promoted more and more as, as a way to get out of the mess we're in. And, and it is science fiction. You know, those companies are selling us science fiction stories because those things are not real. You know, those companies are way better artists than any, uh, anyone here in the room. They're making the world so strange. But we are the collateral damage of the stories they tell investors, not the stories that are actually happening in the world. And, and we all believe those science fiction stories now that are all to do with just money changing hands and nothing to do with the reality you know, of our existence. You had a question. Hello, and thank you so much, uh, Joanna. I'm here today. This is my name from New Zealand. Um, I'm really interested in uh, to hearing briefly from whoever of all the speakers uh, has enlightened <laughs> ideas. Um, from the Rice sisters, I heard several times just you dropped comments about the spiritual, but you didn't go further into that. And Pei Ying said um, the value of life is treated different, differently by different species. And then Oron said, uh, talked about the degrees of violence we are, with, we are willing to exercise towards other living beings. And in that, I was wondering whether we are so currently um, focusing on the technology, our existing existence in the world in terms of the biological that we, we, we sort of treat the, the cultural knowledge of spiritual, or there's many other words for that, but you know, the, the knowledge that is handed down that is embedded in mythology and spirituality and in Germany, which is my place of origin, this is long gone, I think, anyhow, I'm not living here any longer. So I'm really curious to hear how those kind of influences also have a place in your practices. Not sure how I can answer this. <laughs> Um, but I do think uh, I can say what I know, I guess, um, from, I think, throughout her, our journey of three years, um, many aunties, and we met aunties, and then we met young people who are both fermenters, and we met farmers, um, and I, they told us this thing called pen, pantang, pantang which is belief systems um, that are based on facts or sometimes based on beliefs. And there's things such as um, don't drink or eat anything sour before you ferment something. Um, have good thoughts when you ferment because if you have bad thoughts, well, the drink that you make will bring sad feelings and things like that. Um, and Aunt says she was telling us a story like, these things I don't believe, but I believe because if I don't believe, I don't really have a story to tell, which we thought was an interesting um, way of how she expressed it. And, and I think as we um, continued on our research on ferment, fermentation culture or doing farming ourselves, um, there's, there's a gap of what we know and what we trust, choose to know. And um, and even with younger people who are using all these technologies, they, they also told us they, there's this gap where they just have to let go and trust the process. Um, 
So in, in those little snippets of experience, I think we also just doing farming and it's our first time. So we just have having to let go. Um, those are moments where we felt trust, but also trust in the people that we work with. Um, so, so spiritually, truality, it, this process of working um, as a group and working with the people and, and the projects, um, it made us think about spirituality, but with no answers. <laughs> um, but the fact that we feel it in some way is interesting. Um, and yeah, when we also share different beliefs, so just kind of having the space to just talk about it and ask about it um, was a good process for us. Well, I, I guess I'm more in the side. I'm usually half in art, half in science, half Asian, half European, because I live in a European city right now. Uh, all these like differences and also trying to gain the non-human perspective. This perspective change sort of made me realize that one thing is that there are a lot of things that we are unable to explain right now. And it always has been like, it's like, if you have this line, this is the frontier of our knowledge, there's always something beyond. And what happens with this thing beyond is then everyone trying to make system out of it because if without that system you cannot know how you behave that maybe it's a human um, nature that you always want a system to explain something and I think that's where the spirituality comes into play but it's not always just one system I think I quite enjoy playing um, what kind of spiritual system will exist if we are already at that edge of the knowledge and then uh, as the person who made the thought experiment, you have different background, different uh, perspective, different stand and environment, and then you make a different system out of it. And that becomes really fun and sometimes gives you some interesting insights. Yeah. yeah just uh, very shortly. It's a really great question, and this is something that Jonathan and myself have been battling with for the last 20 odd years, almost 30 years, working with life as a medium for artistic expression. And not being spiritual or religious, we still believe that life is special. So how do you generate what we refer to as a form of secular vitalism, the understanding, the recognition that life is different from any other material around us, without resorting to metaphysical kind of argument, is in a sense, the journey that we're going through, and it's still not resolved. And it's something that we, it, it's just, a, you know, I don't think we'll ever resolve it, but striving towards a form of uh, secular vitalism as a way of engaging with life and understanding that life is not like any other material that we are exploiting and extracting value from is the beginning. Thank you so much. Um, you see, this is the classical moment where we actually could plunge more into the discussion and just sit all down and actually discuss one hour and we have already more questions. But the great thing is we structured the conference that we will tomorrow do the discussion walks, the panel walks, and we have taken a lot of notes. And uh, what we do, we just say to be continued, all the thoughts and um, Actually, I have some uh, final, and also, of, of course, please, uh, vir virtual audience, we will come to your questions and pick up the aspects that you were writing in the chat, and we will discuss this tomorrow, and also let you share our outcome of that with you. Um, but what I wanted to say for the for the end, basically, of our, um, I know I'm biased, but I say I'm interesting panel here, panel A, I wanted to actually uh, maybe <laughs> just make a final statement and actually it, it uh, encompasses actually all your pro proposals and suggestions and methodologies and performances that you were quickly sharing with us today but we could definitely say that um, so that the techno-utopianism that we were also hearing from uh, Oron um, today um, which in a way is um, hypermodernism in a way, uh, tries to seduce us to ignore the crisis. And actually this is the crisis that you were indirectly or directly also uh, touching
into the soul crisis, the, the climate crisis, basically. And uh, instead, believe that new technologies of a dreams of their off will save us. And I think we kind of deconstructed that today to critically think about that. So it's no different, basically, and I'm referring to Oran, from Ray Kurzweil and singularity promises um, promises us immortality in a hyper-technological version of the early Soviet belief that science would make us immortal gods. Hmm. And the end, uh, we only got better embalming methods for the corpses of Soviet leaders. So that is actually one of the statements of many, many statements we could give. So the time for the panel A is already over. I would say we all go over and now go over to the interesting point of metabolizing, in other words, eating, right, which Oren told me yesterday is the most intimate thing we can do, actually, eating. So my part is to thank everyone here and uh, inside, outside, uh, virtual world. Thank you so much. Thank you, speakers, to uh, share your knowledge and your engaged wonderful project with us. And I would say now we go over and uh, metabolize and eat. So just very shortly in terms of metabolizing, um, we will meet back here at two o'clock and continue with the next panel. A little tip for people, if you are hungry, there is a restaurant just across here, literally when you come out the door, go straight, called Kala. Um, and the benefit of them, they have nice food and they have student prices and they're very, very close. Um, there are, of course, other places around here as well. If you don't find anything you would like there, there's a pizzeria around the corner. The Deutsche Bank has a mensa at Amstreuter Platz, so there are other places you can eat as well. Um, but if you are around here, you can sit outside here. There is a garden as well. I believe it's a little bit of a storm right now. The sun came out. And um, otherwise, there's also tables in the Berlin Open Lab, which is just on the other side of the garden. We are also very welcome to sit and eat your food if you like. Um, but thank you to everyone and see you back here at two.
Test.
Hello everyone, my name is Sucha Eran. I'm very happy to welcome you back after our lunch break at Hackers Makers Thinkers Conference Day 1 at Design Transfer in person and also on live stream at our uh, Art Roberto Berlin uh, YouTube channel. And we are indeed very happy to be able to get together in the first day in this conference. And also let me thank again to our collaborators, Professor Dr. Michelle Christensen and Professor Dr. Florian Conradi who are holding co-head positions at the research group Critical Maker Culture, Berlin University of Arts and Weizenbaum Institute, that they invited us to meet under this roof of design transfer and contributed to the program. Hackers Make Thinkers, Collective Experiments in Social Fermenting is a series of events, workshops, performances, conference, and an exhibition. We kick off the program already in early May, and we open the doors of the exhibition on May 20th both at Art Laboratory Berlin and also our venue collaborator, Okaka Ram 29. The exhibition will be available for a visit until the 10th of July and more events and workshops will take place in the following weeks. In today's conference, we are excited to bring together artists and special guests around concepts like hacking, social fermentation, a term that used by the Rice Proving Sisters Club, which you have already learned more in the previous panel, and maker culture. For our conceptualization, we use the term of hacking as Mackenzie work suggested to hack is to differ. And I just realized that I'm still wearing my mask. <laughs> Come <down> again. <laughs> uh, in this panel B, which is titled Semiotic Elements, we will focus on the non-human hackers. We will welcome four speakers in the session that two of them are artists of the exhibition, Kamek Lindsay and Irena Griban as well as invited guests, Senami Kofi and Suji Wu. Our first speaker is in the session, is gonna present online actually. Not, unfortunately, he's not available to uh, attend this in-person meeting. That's why we're doing this wonderful hybrid program. And we're very happy to welcome Senami Kofi, who is an architect and anthropologist by training. He advocates a new vernacular concept that he concretely translates as an innovator, designer, and entrepreneur as a scale of product, building, and team. He is the founder of L'Africana de, 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 de Architecture, excuse my French, which is not existing, um, a collaborative platform for research and experimentation on issues of African architecture and cities. He is also the founder of Full Labs, a network of Tongolese tech hubs that aim to make everyone equal in the face of the digital revolution. With his community, he contributes to prototyping a digital collectivism, which has made it possible to launch half a dozen startups in his work. He develops alternative visions on the issues of integrated architecture, primitive competi computationalities, technological democracy, and sustainable cities. His work has been acknowledged by, amongst other, by African Innovation Summit in 2014, the Global Fab Lab, Award, Global FAP Award in 2014, the Ashoka Foundation Fellow since 2017, and the African Leadership Award in 2018. In his virtual participation, he will present an ethics of entangled methods. The floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? And uh, uh, am, I, am I allowed to share my, my screen? Right. Do you have it? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, how much uh, time do I have? Um, 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. So I didn't prepare anything special. Uh, I see it must like a, a conversation. And I would like uh, first to apologize in advance for my, uh, my disastrous English. Uh, so I will just share some uh, some thoughts with you uh, 
uh, on these thematics. And um, as you know, how uh, from a single neurosis center, an infection developed with such rapidity that very quickly there is there was not a corner of the planet that was not contaminated by, by it. Uh, I'm not talking about Corona, I'm talking about capitalism, of course, but we know that uh, it is also in the bed of the violence made uh, to the nature by liberal metropolization and thanks to the leveling of communal system deemed unprofitable, uh, that viruses are formed and established and spread. So we have there two type of pandemics who share uh, the same identity of method through the uh, inconsistency they insinuate in the system of each they disturb the traditional organic, social, and economical uh, structure. But uh, what I would like to share with you is this idea that it is not all with the virality. Uh, we have another type of viral, uh, immersed, surreptitious colonists uh, who propose uh, uh, himself um, more complex in the techno-industrial uh, cyber, uh, cyber system. So we have, uh, on my point of view, uh, a third manifestation of virality. And the, the, the last one, recently uh, endowed with technology, uh, solutionism, and social acceptance in time of coronavirus. So those three levels of virus, the virus in biospherical structure, the virus in social structure, and the virus in technological structure are surprisingly embedded. And um, just talk a little bit about the last one, the, the virality in as he, manif he, he used to manifest itself in the technology. Uh, the technology right now seems to be lead um, by two claims. The first one is after trying for a long time to convince states to function like a company, the capitalism seems to have find it uh, uh, more feasible to transform company in states. So there is the first uh, uh, characteristic of the technological virality I'm talking about. The fact that business today want to be country and be ruled like country will be host uh, uh, in. The second manifestation is that, and for, for explain that, I, will, I would like to ask to the audience if you know what is the first, the very first technology the humanity uh, created. Holes, the, the audience said that holes. Holes, okay, another one. Language? Lorian says language. Okay. No, the very first uh, technology the humanity created is the group, is the community. It is this idea to do things with others. Because if you want to, if, if you want to move a table, it is simple to do it with the help of someone instead of doing it yourself. Or if you want to remember everything I'm saying today, 
you will have a, a, a best uh, 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 result if you do it together than ask one, only one of you to, to do it. So the very first technology that humanity created was the social structure. And the second claim I'm talking about in the technology today who make it working like a virus is the fact that the technology uh, for a long time was inspired by the social structure and was supposed to be at the service of the social structure. But with the digital revolution, we saw that technology don't want anymore to serve the social structure. Technology have this uh, uh, um, claim to become itself a social structure in which the humanity can be host, you know, so that we will visit technology as a new, a new social uh, 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 structure. So this is the true claim uh, of technology who make it uh, like a third level of abstraction. So the first level of, of abstraction is the fact that something try to emancipate itself of the structure of the nature, which creates viruses, biolog biological viruses. The second level of abstraction is these things we make with the economy by creating something we supposed to be a tool, the economy, but who become a reality itself. So the economy was a tool who emancipated itself of the service of the structure. Now the economy have his own law. He take his opinion in itself and he is not anymore anymore uh, 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 managed in a, in a sense by the social structure. And the last uh, abstraction or the last emancipation from the structure is the one we are facing uh, right now with the, uh, with the technological uh, 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 um, emancipation who can, who seems to be leaders uh, to a sort of terminal uh, imperialism, uh, uh, technological imperialism. So what I would just like to share with you very simple is if these three levels of abstraction uh, in a sense uh, coalesce or create an union of abstraction, we will have uh, a sort of derealization. Uh, a new reality can emerge which, which, which will not be uh, a metaverse, but a reality very uh, 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 coherent in this sense that he will be an alternative social, uh, bio, biological and technical coalition uh, who can, uh, in French we say subjugate, who can make our natural uh, reality not efficient anymore and who can uh, kill it. So what uh, 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 I, I want to, to express is this uh, vision is, uh, uh, is a dystopia, of course, but is not uh, uh, a new, uh, a new thing. This, uh, uh, um, dystopia, this three level of separation, who can create a new, a different world, have his origin in, uh, in the history. And specifically in the European history, all this be uh, begin with what we call in French, Les Lumières, with the eight, 18th century and with some thinker, some philosopher, who are beginning to try to solve the problem of the, the hegemony of the church and who create all these modern thoughts. And the modern thoughts was based on two separation. The first separation is what we call the naturalism. And it is this uh, thought of this Descartes uh, that uh, humanity are enslaved in the nature, 
and for the humans to be free, he needs to separate itself from the nature or dominate the nature. So it was the first separation and it was a big moment in the history, maybe the biggest shift in our history because before that, you, did, you, did, you don't have any civilization all over the world who consider that he, he can emancipate itself from the nature. And it is the European center who invent this, uh, uh, this idea. And this idea was followed by a second uh, separation. And uh, this second separation is the separation between humans and humans. Uh, it was defined by this idea that after the separation with the nature, if you really want to be an emancipated human, you need to be separate from the group also for your tribal uh, uh, links for, from the family in this sense that uh, uh, they don't help you to, uh, to, uh, to attend your full potential. So Occid uh, uh, the, the Occidental philosophy or the European uh, center philosophy creates the individualism. And those two separations, individualism and uh, uh, naturalism, was the origin of this triple crisis. Uh, uh, um, I try to sensibilize, sensibilize to you to which is this three level of, uh, of emancipation from the structure or for the service of this, the, 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 the structure. And the question today is to see how we can manage that as we know that this um, uh, global coup uh, made by the, the West uh, who transform his conviction in a software already uh, now shared by all the humanity didn't work because he created those separation who uh, uh, are the, uh, the origin of a lot of problems we are facing right now. How can we change this reality? And how can we develop a new paradigm which is not a rationalist, uh, naturalist, and individualist paradigm, but who, which, which will be a paradigm of non-separation, a paradigm of entangle, entanglement. And just to give uh, maybe uh, one idea, I would like to propose to check in other geography what was the, the basis of their organic, uh, non-separable non idea uh, uh, philosophy. And this basis seems to be their cosmogony. Because the cosmogony is something in traditional society who, uh, who uh, propose the social structure like something who is uh, tightly entangled or um, uh, net with the biospherical structure. Because the cosmogony explains the totality by one of each one of his parts and each part with the totality. So that leads by this uh, concept, which is the cosmogony, People can't, uh, don't have this temptation, uh, this ambition to create societies who make separation between humans and nature and between humans and humans and with what we are facing right now, between humans and his capacity who are supposed to be uh, manifest in technology or in tools. And just to uh, illustrate that, I would like to share uh, with you uh, uh, a cosmogony, uh, but a cosmogony of uh, Lele people. So Lele people are people uh, you find in the middle of Africa. 
And in this uh, society, you have a very uh, interesting con symbolical construction of non-separation uh, of uh, tightly uh, integration of everything based on pangolin. So I think more, most of you know this little animal. Uh, it is one of the animals who are facing uh, a dis his disparation right now because he's a lot hunt. He is one of the more uh, uh, um, beneficiary business right now, more than uh, the cocaine, etc. Uh, pangolin traffic make a lot of money. So uh, you have a lot of uh, members of this, his species who are trade from Africa to, uh, to, to, to China, China uh, mainly. And uh, um, pangolin, in fact, is a very inoffensive animal. It's a small, very small animal, but interesting for a lot of aspects. The first one is the fact that the pangolin, when you surprise him, he used to hide his head. So uh, uh, he didn't, uh, I don't know how you say fear. He didn't try to run away, but he hide his head. So the lay people say that pangolin is an animal who have conscience and who feel uh, what in French we say, la honte, you know. So they learn a lot of uh, morality by observing uh, pangolin. Pangolin is also an animal you can uh, you can have in your house and trying to make it uh, uh, produce kids or uh, small pangolin. Pangolin lets himself itself die if he is in captivity. So the lay people say that it is an animal who teach the humanity the irreductibility to be not. Uh, uh, managed by this idea to make profits, but to live for uh, 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 this sort of radicality of existing, you know. Uh, as you know, pangolin is a border animal. He can live in water, he can climb to tree, he can stand like a human. So there is a very beautiful cosmogony uh, in which the pangolin is the animal who brings the civilization to to humans and all the architecture of the lay people and a lot of, of their social structure, their political structure are based of in, in the observation of the pangolin, a lot of ritual also. By example, uh, people, the lay people consider that uh, the pangolin is a representation of the humans in the wild. And the wild itself have a representation between the human community, which is the, the chief the king of Lele. So you have some ritual in which the king used to meet the pangolin to discuss the, the, uh, the relation between human society and the wild society and try to sign contracts, you know, so that this, this relation didn't create conflict. In fact, the pangolin cannot be hunted, And if it is, it's supposed to be regulated, but it is not the case anymore because those people lose more and more because of the urbanity, the remembrance of this very nice uh, cosmogony who, who was for a long time a tool to make their societies uh, um, embedded, uh, uh, very tightly integrated to the natural structure, the cosmic structure, et cetera, et cetera. So that, this, is, this is the small story I would like to share with you. And by saying that maybe we have a potential by exploring the conceptual paradigm uh, people create, original one in other geography to try to find solution to the inefficacy or non-efficiency of the capitalist paradigm we have right now. Thank you. Thank you, Senami. Thank you so much.
um, because Sename needs to attend to another event, uh, so we will not be able to include him for our Q&A at the end. So if you have any immediate questions, you can ask one question to Sename before he leaves in relation to the way that he's connecting with the technologies, how we are just socially start, I mean, the first technological in, in, in invention, as you mentioned, as uh, creating a community is the first technological investment uh, invention that we had. Any comments or any questions to send them before we move on? Because we will not be able to ask any questions in the Q&A. Gloria. Hey, Sanami. Good to see you again. Um, yes, maybe just to elaborate on, on, on your suggestion, like how to, if we take uh, uh, your aspect of the pangolin, uh, what would you suggest um, when we go back and look at those uh, narratives and rituals? How do we entangle ourselves into the mess we, we have created? Yes, I don't have uh, a, a, a solution uh, precisely, but I, I, I just saw that in very uh, traditional societies, they have this organical way of seeing things who avoid the, um, the problem we have in our modern societies. And maybe we should build a new cosmogony, but a generally shared cosmogony uh, uh, today, and maybe it is the solution, but this cosmogony have these uh, difficulties that the one we have to build should be shared by all the humanity. Uh, but the old cosmogony are embedded in very localized societies. So it is the challenge. And it is also a new cosmogony who, which if you follow me very well, have, should have this power not only to articulate the human structure, ideally in the biospherical structure, but also to articulate the uh, technological structure in the human structure without any uh, point of uh, um, uh, disturbance. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining virtually to our conference, Hackers, Makers, Thinkers, and Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Kamak Lindsay, whose work, Hollow Beans Relics from the Revolution, is on view at the Hackers, Makers, Thinkers Collective Experiments on Social Fermenting. Kevin McLindsay is an artist whose practice uh, includes bio arts, DIY techniques, and political music theater, expanding the space to redistribute uh, stolen features through performances and installations. They work together with code, voice, sound, and materialization of matrix, ghosts, and clouds. Based in Berlin, they produced their first eight hour musical uh, with M.I. Gliese. Is it correct? <laughs> uh, Palace in May 2017 and in 2019 premiered their most recent musical composition, Visible Window, releasing the recording online with the label Quantum Natives. Their works have been presented in Berlin at KW State Studio in Howe and internationally at Café Otto, London, Ars Electronica Linz, Rick's uh, Open Fields Rica, and Encuentro Tecnofeminista in Mexico City. Kamak Lindsay will talk about their science fiction, musical installation and performance, Holobind Relics and the Revolution. On the 7th of July, excerpts of compositions from Siona Toxic Romance with Kamak Lindsay as a factory worker and featuring Hani Fiosmond as artist in law. This will take place in PA58 on July 7th, that we will um, announce it soon again. So. Hello, everybody. How exciting. It's been two years of online uh, happening. So this is nice to be physically with people. Um, 
Yes, and to see your eyes. <laughs> Very nice. Um, oh, no problem. I will begin and say, hold your applause for the end in case you have a feeling you might want to applause in the middle. It's okay? This way? This camera. Ah, sorry. Ah. Yeah. Now it's okay? Okay. Two computers. <laughs> When did a song become more than heartfelt? When did a song stop making our hearts melt? I've heard the song for so long, they've hushed out. And there's no way that they're stopping us now. When did a song become something to sell? When the words we forgot to our song somehow. Now in my heart, I our song and I'll always remember and with you sing along never forget the songs of our past the songs we sing together to forge a brighter path Cyanobacteria evolved roughly 2.5 billion years ago, introducing for the first time oxygen and photosynthesis into our atmosphere and um, <clears throat> encouraging and initiating the growth of life into what we know today, including mammals such as ourselves and the evolution of all organisms. They are the largest and the most important group of bacteria, bacteria on earth. Um, the habitants, the habitats of cyanobacteria are limnic bodies of water, such as lakes and ponds and marine environments. They flourish in water that is salty, brackish, or fresh, in cold and hot springs, and in environments where no other life microalgae can exist. Cyanobacteria have the impressive ability to colonize infertile substrates such as volcanic ash, desert sand, and rocks. They borrow hollows into limestone, sandstone, and they can withstand and survive in both extremely high and low temperatures. <clears throat> Cyanobacteria is often referred to as blue-green algae, but this is uh, perhaps not true as they are no algae at all, but a bacteria. Um, so, but then what is the difference between algae and cyanobacteria? And I will explain to you with my beautiful drawing I did on the computer. Um, so I will actually, what I'm referring to is green algae, so not a, my, a macro algae that you would think of as seaweed, but it's a small, like cyanobacteria, they're sp small microscopic microalgae or phytoplankton. And both can uh, use go, go through photosynthesis, trapping the light energy with the chlorophyll pigments that they can use to uh, synthesize oxygen. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh, oh, I went too fast. So uh, one of the main differences is that cyanobacteria is a prokaryotic organism and it lacks a nucleus and a mitochondria. And this is often referred to as something that is more primitive and basic compared to the green algae that has a nucleus and is so therefore eukaryotic. So within this definition and this separation of the both, you have also this um, uh, something that I would say is not correct is that we view something as more primitive because it's something more less evolved and doesn't have a center point of intelligence such as nucleus. 
Um, and if you look in the green algae, they have something known as a chloroplast that the cyanobacteria does not have. Oh, it speaks slow. <clears throat> and something they all have in common is that cyanobacteria, green algae, along with diatoms and dinoflagellates, which also uh, have some sort of nucleus, are all within the group of microalgae or phytoplankton. Yeah. Hey. So then what is a chloroplast that this green algae has and as well the diatoms and um, the dinoflagellates as well many other things on this earth, but I will stick today to phytoplankton and, and uh, one group of organisms. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so they all have a chloroplast. What is a chloroplast? Um, a chloroplast actually is a cyanobacteria that lives inside plant cells in which this is how they synthesize food for themselves. Billions and billions of years ago, cyanobacteria began to take up residency within certain, what we refer to as eukaryotic cells. As the good house guests they were, they would make food for their host and the ancestors of these algaes and their plants today in return have this chloroplast, which is actually the ancestral descendants of a cyanobacteria. So in other words, within this uh, organelle chloroplast, there is a tiny uh, cyanobacteria inside. Not exactly, but you, I like to think of it this way. <laughs> um, an endosymbiosis, which I briefly touched on, is a symbiosis in which one of the symbiotic organisms lives inside the other. So at this, in this case, you had the cyanobacteria that was living within the tiny cells. <clears throat> and then at some point it didn't escape this host and it became a part of the host itself. Um, examples of this are the leaf slug, which is awfully cute. Uh, are the leaf, uh, no, this is the leaf sheep or the leaf slug, but they're both the same, just different views of it. Um, yeah, and they have the algaes, chloroplasts within its own cells. And this is how it produces energy from itself by taking energy from the sun. Another example is the spotted salamander, which is in, in partaking in endosymbiosis from the green algae. Then you have lichen, which are also an example of symbiosis with um, usually cyanobacteria, green algae. And then that gets us to humans. But if you look at humans, we all have within ourselves a mitochondria, which is as well an organelle that has a striking resemblance to that of the chloroplasts on the other side. <laughs> um, hey. And what scientists believe, because they look so similar, is that um, perhaps these, these uh, organelles that we have in our cells that called the mitochondria are also descendants of the cyanobacteria that had undergone an endosymbiosis and are still a part of us as a relic of the symbi uh, ancestral symbiosis within all humans and all life that has a mitochondria such as the sleeze, she slug, leaf slug, the spotted salamander, the lichen, insects, cows, animals, plants, they all have some, they all can be connected to the root of life through cyanobacteria. And we've all undergone this symbiosis with cyanobacteria within our history of existence. <clears throat> Yeah. And through our language that has enforced through Disney or media, we have somehow separated this history, historical symbiosis as instead of viewing nature or the cyanobacteria as something that is a part of us and irreplaceably a part of our history, we have made it this evil, dem uh, not demonic, sorry, <laughs> evil character who steals our humanity, such as in the Ariel movie, no, The Little Mermaid, the evil character steals the voice of Ariel while the prince is her future and her sustainability. <clears throat> but symbiosis shows us that trees of life often grow in on itself 
and that species come together, fuse, and make new beings who start again. The coming together of branches. One can hear the fusing. The tree of life is a twisted, tangled, pulsing entity with roots, branches meeting underground, and in midair to form new fruits and hybrids. In the 16th century, a pre-industrial society that would eventually blossom into what we know today as capitalism struggled with, at the time, popular beliefs of mysticism and magic. And uh, they took rebellious bodies and they separated them and dissected them and, and publicly and anatomical, in anatomical theaters, as this was the beginning of how we would view the human body as something functional and mechanical so that we could modify it and separate it from its mysticism that was popular at the time. And we could then control the human body to mechanicalize it for profit, for a rising bourgeoisie class within a capitalist system. So then by doing this, we took nature and man and we wielded it to the needs and the concepts of progress within the patriarchal structure of family and state. And yeah. So with all I've spoken about, how can we use this to forge new ideas and um, speculate using stories and songs as often historically songs have proven as ways of storytelling and things are passing through to each other. Um, important instructions or history that we want to pass on to each other. And um, through this project, Hollow Beyond, I, I started to speculate how can I combine a story that, use, that is with, including all rebellious bodies, such as cyanobacteria and the working class together. <clears throat> So this also becomes even more important today, as you see, um, since the 1970s, as a relic of climate change, you have uh, cyanobacteria and algae have uh, been starting to occur as toxic blooms in all over the world, due often to rising surface temperatures um, and over nutrients in the water due to like, fertilizers. And, and you see this increase as well eh, following the, and fo the ending of the industrial, the industrial revolution in the global north. Um, da -da -da. So what is bad about these toxic blooms is that often they cut off the oxygen in the water to the, which is quite bad for all the marine organisms living in the water as they tend to die, as they also need oxygen as well. It is toxic to humans, can get into the water supply and can cause severe liver damage. It depends on the type of toxin that is found within the, um, these blooms. And there's a very different kind, but they're quite bad. Um, here is one example in the Gulf of Mexico at the Gulf of the Mississippi River that is due often to the agricultural fertilizers that because of overproduction of um, plants or of crops, it then over fertilizes and goes into the river. And this occurs every time in the summer, no matter how they try to clean it up, it always returns. This past year you had in Marmara Sea in Turkey, a sea snot or mucilage of phyto, different phytoplanktons as well. And you, had, you have still um, in the Mediterranean Sea, Osteopsis, which is a dinoflagellate and is also due to uh, increasing seawater temperatures. And is, as well, a lot of these algaes were not in, uh, natural to these environments and were often brought there through uh, colonialism and imperialism. For example, the Osteopsis only has existed or has found to be existing in the Mediterranean Sea after the opening of the Suez Canal. Um, so then we spend a lot of money to try to get rid of these toxic blooms, but the idea is that we don't actually 
fix the root of the problem because you can try to ease these conditions that lead to them, but then the root of the problem is the overproduction, for example, or, yeah. <clears throat> so we have more occurrences of these toxic algaes and cyanobacteria. So we think, how can we make them useful within our system? So we separate them from their toxins and we consider how we can transform them into products such as biofuels and pharmaceuticals. And this is an example of a bio, uh, bio algae farm. And we make them into little shampoos and spirulina powder that is very healthy and nutritious for you. And uh, at the same time, we have a struggling working class that as climate change persists and increases and affects their environment, we our anger grows as long as well along with their toxins. So I wanted to create a story that brings together the toxins of the cyanobacteria with the anger of the working class. And that is how the installation came together. And the installation as well, I constructed and wrote a short story and sang an old uh, song from Bertolt Brecht in the narrative, um, which is actually written from the perspective of a horse, which I switched to this installation to be the perspective of the cyanobacteria. And you have the sound within the space that is generated from the temperature and the pH of the cyanobacteria, as well from the temperature of the surrounding air and the installation that then intertwines itself all together to have a story with this perspective of this fictionalized worker in a factory with that of the stories of the cyanobacteria, which is interesting because temperature and pH within the cyanobacteria reactor that you see here and that I have a cyanococcus, I can't say it so well, a cyanobacteria growing. At this point, after many years, it as well has a brown algae as well inside. But the pH and temperature creates quite a homeostasis within the installation. So kind of have this womb-like feeling that we are symbiotically undergoing this transformation together to bring our stories together. And I collected their data. Here's some of their data from 2020. And I as well analyzed it in neural networks to look at the patterns that are changing in the data temperatures, but not changing so much, but it's a still ongoing process for me because I really would like the sound of their growth, but I think at the moment I'm looking into spectrometry in order to analyze the cell growth of the cyanobacteria rather than the pH and temperature because it can't get so much action. Though that's also beautiful in a way. So then the reactor is as well, the light is being reflected from the reactor throughout the space that subjugates the space. So the idea is to feel the presence of the cyanobacteria around you because often these blooms of toxic algae are growing in spaces that we are not seeing every day as such as an ocean or lake when a lot of us live in quite large cities and buildings and don't see so much nature. As well, I have a created a fixated microscope. So instead of inspecting a microscope down, the microscope image of the cyanobacteria is projected around in the space. I may be going crazy with my hands. <laughs> yeah. And then the idea was to do a performance with them. Yes, there we go. More images. I think I'm coming to an end. Do I still have time? No. Oh, am I? Go oh, you should just tell me to stop. Oh. 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 Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and I hope it made sense to you. <laughs> thank you so much for your uh, presentation, Kamak. So. As you heard at the very beginning, Kamak is going to perform more of that uh, the July 7th. 
And then I would like to quickly introduce my next speaker, uh, Irene, or Ira. Um, Ira Agrivana, Agrivina, um, was born and raised in Java, Indonesia, where the practice of science, myth, and tradition sometimes uh, mixed into one. Irene is a founding member of the famous Hon Collective, as well as XX Lab Award Next Idea Art and Technology Grant at Ars Electronica in 2015. As an artist, technologist, and educator, she works at the intersection between art, science, and technology and is engaged in collaborative, cross disciplinary, and multimedia actions responding to social, cultural, and environmental changes. Her projects have been presented internationally in IFVA, New Media Art Festival, Hong Kong in 2017, Fifth on Young Public Arts Project in South Korea in 2016, Arts Electronic Festival in Austria in 2015. Uh, and Pixaleka Festival, Helsinki, Finland in 2013. So the floor is yours. I will just quickly just open up your presentation. Hello. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, ah, okay. <laughs> And uh, because now we can travel and gather again, for me, it's kind of like a dream. <laughs> uh, after isolated uh, for almost two, two and a half years. And then, uh, yeah, so thank you also for the team of uh, a, 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 at Laboratory Berlin. Thank you to Jay and uh, Regina and uh, Chris, so I can be here. And is it okay? Uh, so I think I will uh, uh, present, I think, more ideas because I think Kamak and after this uh, Sujin will explain more about uh, this cyanobacteria. So my presentation is, uh, I think, is more about the prototype and ideas of the use of this uh, symbiosis, two symbiosis of uh, water fun and uh, uh, but uh, cyanobacteria called anabaina. Hmm? <laughs> Sorry, it's stuck. <laughs> okay. And then, so uh, this uh, this waterfront is called Asola. So the Asola and Anabene symbiosis has been called a superorganism that combines the individual talents of these two different organisms. And for me, it's very romantic because they can like married. And then uh, this is kind of like perfect marriage because uh, there is no divorce for them. If they divorce, so one of them will die. So the cyanobacterium and Anabena evolved during the early history of the earth, like Amak said before, and then uh, this, uh, and three billion years ago, when the planet atmosphere was uh, devoid of oxygen, the, and the other organism is, uh, like I said before, is the fern asola. And because this unique symbiosis in which these two parts have successfully evolved into a system that makes important contribution to the ecology, biofertilization, uh, and biotechnology. And like I say, it's perfect marriage. It's kind of like Adam and Eve for me. And then we will see later uh, uh, the present uh, the, the presentation of them as and this the symbiosis between Asola with the Sanobacterium anabena in this perfect marriage. Livocolus provide an ideal home for anabena, which throws down atmospheric nitrogen. And this fertilizes our solar, making it one of the fastest growing plants on the planet, doubling its biomass every two and two, three days, even so its only requirements are air, light and fresh water and small quantities of, nut of nutrients. Asola and, and anabena is the only known symbiosis the, in which this uh, tisianobacterial partner is maintained throughout the plants, reproductive cycle resulting in their co-evolution and the extreme efficiency of the Asola Anabena superorganism. This um, amazing uh, symbiosis of these uh, two creatures is, could bring great effects on CO2 and reduce climate change. 
and this is actually like uh, the diagram of the use uh, uh, that can be used of this uh, symbiosis. I cannot really see it, <laughs> but I hope you can uh, read it. And uh, the project started when me and my uh, collective uh, call at 2013 is working with uh, some farmers around uh, in around Java. And then uh, it's continue when they are sell, then they have uh, some uh, replacement of the chemical fertilizer. And then it turns out that uh, Asola Anabena was used um, among the, oops, <laughs> the farmers among Southeast Asia that uh, as a biofertilizer centuries ago. But and then, uh, there is also another use that I propose to the farmers, but then, then working with the local farmers in Java is not so easy because there are so many rituals, so many uh, offering ceremony, blah, blah, blah. And then I have to use an anthropological to, to uh, anthropological way and background to introduce uh, this uh, Asola and Anabena for uh, future smart farming. And there is this famous living goddess, not living is actually a myth, but then and she's very well known, the rice goddess among Southeast Asia. It's called Devi Sri in, uh, in Java, Bali, and some other islands in Indonesia. It's called another uh, uh, name. And like you can see, it's Mayan Kwan Kau or Posop in Thailand. Nang Kosop in Laos, Ponagar in Vietnam and Cambodia. Maybe in Korea, they also have this uh, famous rice goddess as the symbol of uh, love and fertility. Uh, that's so, so called Devi Sri in Java. And this is, uh, so Devi Sri is, the story is actually uh, almost the same with the Asola and Anabena. So it's uh, creatures from fall down from the sky and then uh, it got married with a human, so it's like a, uh, another uh, symbiosis also of another, uh, another uh, creatures. And then uh, her body and then become a rice and then it's become a fertilizer for the uh, rice field. And this is in Thailand. And this is uh, another story, but uh, still a bit similar in uh, Myanmar and Laos. And this is in Cambodia, it's called uh, Onagar. A bit different because this is a mother of uh, thousands uh, sons. <laughs> and then it's become a country, uh, Cambodia one country in between Cambodia and Vietnam. And then there are so many mantras uh, in Indonesia and uh, praise according to this goddess. And when we started to, uh, uh, to plant or harvest, so we have to, to say this mantra or, uh, to, or when there is like storm like before and then we say this mantra and then uh, disappears. We hope it. <laughs> yes, this is, uh, I just collected the. Uh... Yeah, so the, the project is uh, to really try to find uh, the connection of these two different particles. And then uh, at the same time is how actually uh, it can be applied uh, among the farmers in uh, Southeast Asia. And so I come with the prototype uh, first time uh, when I did the residency at EV of uh, uh, Hong Kong. And then I continued at the NTU CCA. So uh, how to connect actually between uh, this, uh, uh, what can I say? Sorry, I lost my, my English spoken apart. Uh, how to connect actually from this, uh, this biotechnology with the, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, like with the prototype of uh, 
a design actually that can be received uh, easily with the farmers because uh, they live with the uh, their knowledge about the scientific is not the same uh, from the scientific uh, from the scientific but from the scientific part but how to use this protocol in the same way and it can be very uh, it can be accepted and then it can be applied uh, in the in the farm so despite the technical engineering research and anthropological research about the connection between human culture and their environment uh, was done, that the myth about the goddess of fertility known as Dewi Sri and Mai Kwangpo and Posop and Nangkosop and Ponaga in Cambodia, the beautiful goddess that uh, uh, fall down from the, the sky and then Come actually this uh, prototype, uh, the, uh, the first prototype. So this project trying to seek the relation between the earth and outer space and using the photosynthetic, the photosynthesis and process of Asola and Anabena. And the other hand is trying to bring the goddess of rice alive by representing her as a physical representation of us as an Asola plant. So this Asola and Anabena known as the pioneer plants and microorganism of the earth, while the goddess of fertility known as the one who brought the plants and living environment on earth. The connection between earth and sky, myth and ritual, slinga and yoni, art and science will be made by represent the goddess of the source of life and the source food and energy and sustainable protos, prototype of a worship shrine. So this is actually a work that present at the Art Laboratory Berlin. So this is the design of uh, which you, uh, the people in Java actually uh, have this rain. The farmers in Java usually have this rain at their home. And uh, this is a uh, rain when they do the offering to these coders. And then so the idea is uh, to make this rain as a the sustainable source of power and energy. And at the same time, it's actually make the goddess alive. So this uh, prototype is, uh, I made the microbial uh, fuel cell from the symbiosis of Asola and Anabena and turn it uh, uh, into a sustainable power. And then at the same time, it can be used as a, uh, uh, bio fertilizer, live food stock, and many other things. So, thank you, and please see the exhibition at the at laboratory. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ira. Um, I'm gonna just quickly stop sharing and then, yeah, multitasking. Wonderful. Okay, so actually we started to have this like a connection between the capital system, how the technology is invented and what kind of technologies that we have been exploring. And then we just explore cyanobacteria as the first hacker on earth. And uh, so we started to have this like a kind of an artistic intervention and we're closing the session with a scientific uh, explanation of cyanobacteria. So I'm very happy to welcome uh, Xu Chi Wu. Uh, she's a PhD candidate uh, at uh, biology at the Free University Berlin. She obtained her master's degree in science at the Department of Plant and Environmental Sciences, the University of Copenhagen in Ergonomy, uh, specializing in plant science. Uh, Wu also had a year of working experience of microalgae mediated biocontrol and biofertilizer, as well as strong background in plant pathology. Uh, additionally, she has a keen interest in image analysis to explore biological research. Xu Ji Wu is currently conducting di diversity of far red cyanobacteria in extreme environments, supervised, supervised by Dr. Nunbeck. Wu investigates the myo microbial communities of West Sahara and Salt Lake that can support far red light photosynthesis. Welcome. And the floor is yours, and I will quickly open your presentation. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Shu Jie Wu from uh, Institute of Biophysics, uh, Free University of Berlin. 
Thank you so much to meet you here. And also thanks for Art Labor uh, Laboratory uh, Berlin to give me this chance to share in the story of the cyanobacteria and also my research. And if you have any uh, question during my presentation, you can interrupt me and ask me the question. Thank you. So here I'm going to talk about my uh, research about diversity of far right sand bacteria in extreme environment. So uh, thanks for previous presentation already uh, talk about some sand bacteria, but I'm um, uh, going to uh, still talk about some a little bit further of, of the cyanobacteria. What are the uh, what are they? They are a large and diverse group of photosynthetic prokaryota, and they are also the only uh, photosynthetic bacteria that can produce oxygen. That means it has a huge contribution to the Earth, and uh, we can see some detailed data, which shown here the marine. The bacteria produce more than 25 percentage of the night primary productivities in the ocean, and also terrestrial and the bacteria also contribute a lot to the global photosynthetic. And also, this organism is very tough and resilient organism. That means it can live almost in everywhere of the uh, world, uh, ranging from the fresh water and the seawater and in underneath of the stone, sandy, or uh, even inside of the plants. So uh, if, uh, maybe you will ask me, why do we study this topic? There's two main uh, reasons. The first, of course, the cyanobacteria is very important. It's the first primary producer that can use life drive photosynthesis uh, to produce uh, organism compounds and oxygen. And another, we are very interested in this, how this organism adapt to this extreme environment, uh, especially in shaded environments like the desert and the salt lake. So now I have to give you one question. Can photosynthesis occur in dark condition? I hope all of you can uh, on, uh, answer this question after my presentation. So let's talk about more about the shaded environment. So what's happened on in, uh, this environment? Uh, it's actually a far right line enriched in habitats. You can imagine when you uh, when when uh, you can imagine like uh, when you see a leaf, uh, why it's green? Have you considering about it? That because the leaves can absorb most of the blue and red light, which you can see this spectrum here, and they reflect the green light. So this is why you see the leaves and they are the uh, with the green color. But uh, under this situation, how the bacteria can live uh, inside or under this environment? Uh, they have few strategy. First, it's they develop a new symbiotic relationship with some plants like uh, Azola, which uh, talked before, and this picture showing the symbiotic relationship with Balazo and uh, not to, uh, um, cyanobacteria. But my research topic is, is more focused on how to use this far right light, which is inv invisible light. Uh, in the environment, you can see some cyanobacteria still live underneath of the rock or this sandy stone, which find it in this uh, Antarctic uh, area. So, uh, they how to how they use this uh, far right light for the photosynthesis? Here is the answer, and there there has a process called far right light photo optimization. During this process, that means it can grow under the far right light and it can use this special light for their uh, oxygenic photosynthesis. And uh, uh, for this, they create some new pigments which called chlorophyll D and chlorophyll F. And these are the 
uh, new pigments chemical structure here. And not only they have these new pigments, they also have a new mechanic of the photosynthetic system inside. And uh, with the cooperation of the PS2, uh, they also have a very special antenna system. Uh, it's called Ficobilism, which help the cyanobacteria harvest more widely light. And uh, after this protein absorb the different light, they can pa pass through to the PS2, uh, which well, uh, well, they can use for, for further phot uh, photosynthesis. So back to my topic, uh, there's a two major objectives uh, for my research. First is isolate, identify, and study the diverse and bacteria which can support fluoride photosynthesis in extreme environment. And the second, we will further understand how this shaded habitat impact, impact this fluoride and bacteria adaptation. And uh, our hypothesis is far right and bacteria have advantage of the being adopted to this ex extreme environment. And here is the my method from my experiment. So first step, of course, we are going to collect those samples from natural and the picture showing you uh, some the uh, two extreme environment. One is West Sahara Desert and another is Clifton, Australia Salt Lake. And later, when bring back to the lab, I will isolate them and incubate them under, under white light and far right light. And further, I will do some morphological and spectroscopy analyze on them. And the second approach, I will extreme, uh, ex extract their DNA and sequencing them and get some bioinformatics information to analyze their diversity. So to help you uh, more easier understand what I'm doing on the, uh, in the lab, there are some pictures from my experiment. So the first picture showing here is some sandy sample which collect from the underneath of the sand. You can see there are still some green stuff on the or inside of stone. Those are the sand bacteria. And after that, I will take them to the small pieces and inoculate them into a liquid culture and uh, also, I will try to inoculate them solid culture to purify them. And uh, the picture below are some microscopic picture from cyanobacteria. And the first one is from the uh, normal uh, uh, light uh, microscopic picture, which may be uh, not easy to see. Uh, they're actually the, the, the Big one is the algae, and the cyanobacteria are those very small, tiny pieces which live together with the algae. This is what happened in most cases in nat natural environment. And also the picture, uh, and based on their uh, on their uh, fluorescence properties, we can use confocal microscope to see they are more clearly and beautifully under confocal microscopy, which is are the picture from here. But because of the project, uh, maybe you cannot say it very clearly, but uh, it indicates different shape of the cyanobacteria under this environment. And uh, oh, uh, don't forget this uh, organism is very small and the bar, the bar here is around, sorry, is around 30, nanometer, that means it's e even hard to see them clearly under a normal microscopy. Yeah, and here's come to my results. So I, uh, based on the confocal microscopic picture, I can clearly show, uh, show uh, see the, their pigments located and the magenta pigments show me the chlorophyll A and the fecal zones location. And uh, the yellow, uh, yellow channel shows the chlorophyll D and F, which you can compare the white light string and far right light string. There's only uh, chlorophyll D and F appears uh, in the far right light string, which indicate these new pigments help them adopt this special environment. And uh, this is very uh, beautiful pattern. Uh, we call it zebra pattern, like combined with the different pigments. 
And uh, this is the base. And also you can see the difference between the white line and far right line string. The, uh, the far right line string has the right shift of the fluorescence intensity compared to the white line. And later, when I collect their DNA and sequencing, I build a phyl phylogenetic tree to analyze their diversity. And the, the streams which marked with this red bar indicate that those streams have the far right uh, light photosynthetic ability. And you can see it's very diverse distribute in the host and bacteria group. And uh, also this green uh, streams, um, it's the one I isolate from my uh, study. So the summary of my research uh, from now on is like, first in this study, I successfully isolate and uh, uh, study a large unrepresentative group of the far right cyanobacteria. And uh, those cyanobacteria are widely distributed in the nature. And uh, also this right shift chlorophyll D and F are extensively present in extreme and shaded environment. So maybe now you can answer the question, can photosynthesis occur in dark condition? And of course the answer is yes, they, they can still use far right light which our human eyes cannot see it. It's very uh, dramatic. Yeah, and uh, here I will uh, thank all of my colleagues from FU uh, Berlin University and uh, thank you my supervisor, Dr. Dennis Newberg and uh, special thanks of Dr. Daniel from Liverpool University to collect the sample at the uh, beginning. And that's all, thank you. We don't have so much time left, unfortunately. Therefore, I would like to in uh, invite Kamak and Ira here as well for maybe like a seven minute, uh, eight minute question uh, session because we want to move on with a little tour of uh, students tour here before we have a um, coffee break. Therefore, we have like a seven, 10 minutes uh, for questions. So if you have any questions, please come forward. And uh, what do you need? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Ta -da! Uh, if you have any questions, please come forward. And <laughs> okay. okay. This is this is the way I understand. Any questions from the room? Please come forward. Then then I will um, start. Okay, then I am actually curious, maybe how we can just interpret this situation. You said that actually, yes. Uh, the, okay, I, I don't know how to elaborate the question now. <laughs> because you already answered that, okay, actually the, the uh, photosynthesis exists uh, in the dark uh, environment, but how beneficial this could be for uh, future actually, because under certain climate crisis, how this could be in an interesting uh, possibility for other human and non-human organisms to look at this uh, cyanobacteria, because it could be toxic, but at the same time it is beneficial as well. So well, why you were interested in this uh, perspective? Thank you for your question. It's a very good one. So I may explain it, it a little bit well. Like as I thought, it's a very a primary produ producer. It can use this far right light. That means it more photon or more light, not only visible light can be used for the photosynthesis, but also the far right light. Uh, what's this special part of the far right light? Because a lot of places are shaded, like we maybe you heard about the vertical farming system. They want to use limited space to grow more plants. Uh, and it's also the same because there are some, a lot of competition in the nature. So when this organism can use far right light as the photosynthesis, that means it it uh, do not have to like live directly under the sunlight. They can still live inside of the soil, inside of sandy. They have a new niches in the earth. So that's their like 
kind of different power or different energy resource comes from. And uh, when I talk about this potential ability, furthermore, like this one has very uh, huge potential can be used for like maybe Mars immigration because this uh, sand bacteria are very tolerant organism. So, and also uh, NASA already work a lot of experiment with sand bacteria. They put them into the uh, uh, space and let them bruise or to see what's happened on them. Uh, if they can use this far right light, that means future when we move to another uh, plan planet, uh, it may help really. So, uh, yeah, because the atmosphere in another place or outside of space is quite different from the Earth. So that if they can use different light, that means we kind of uh, improve the, our uh, ability uh, for living in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there any other comments, questions from please? <laughs> you can... Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment, but uh, I think it would be good to remember that uh, before cyanobacteria, there were other anaerobic organisms that uh, cyanobacteria poisoned to death uh, by producing oxygen. And we need to acknowledge that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, do you have any questions to each other, actually, since the scientists and the artists are coming together? Maybe this is also an interesting possibility for them to just have a kind of a conversation. <laughs> if you don't have any questions from the room. Um, you don't know, you know, have to. <laughs> the cyanobacteria from extreme environments but okay. the, the yeah it's kind of also uh because when i'm looking for the phd i just find this oh this project is really interesting uh like i prevail uh, previous i work with uh microalgae which called uh uh Oh, sorry, I forgot the name, but it's, it's not cyanobacteria, but I worked with microalgae before, which beneficial in the agriculture. And later when I say, okay, this topic is, is really interesting because uh, uh, as me, as a biologist, I never think about uh, the photosynthesis can use uh, invisible light. It's also unbelievable for me at the beginning. So uh, I decided, okay, I, I, I want to study more. I want to learn how this process done or how this new pigments happening uh, in this uh, uh, dramatic organism. Still, there's a lot of unknown things under it. So we are kind of like exploring them and uh, hope to understand more about these uh, things in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, for Ira and Kamak, actually, uh, because in your both works, there is a very strong uh, storytelling. And can you actually a little bit expand on the storytelling? Because both of you were telling the whole process of the project, but the storytelling section uh, stayed a little bit um, limited in the presentations. Maybe we can use this like a discussion opportunity to talk about the storytelling part of the project. Yeah, that's actually the question I want to ask, <laughs> because like uh, uh, you saw it, uh, our both uh, 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 project actually. So we bring also like the yeah storytelling. I bring the myth and you brought the storytelling that uh, uh, popular among, and uh, I didn't. Uh, for me, it's actually can like uh, become uh, like a good narrative, and be, it's like a. Uh, it's kind of like the story of this symbiosis. So this uh, there is this myth and there is this uh, 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 scientific background that have, that can be merged actually and can be applied uh, uh, for the use for uh, daily life and for the future, like you say. But uh, uh, I also want to know from the scientific uh, uh, perspective, like uh, about the uh, about that. You, you want to know like more into detail of this symbiotic relationship between this? Yeah, the, the thought, I think. Good, my thought. Uh, 
Prince Philip. No, but I was more interested in how your art is and the practices that are it's like our story is, is embedded, but that was not really, you didn't have a chance to talk much. Okay, that's she awesome. changed it now. <laughs> so what about you? Your <laughs> stories. <laughs> I actually think what, what you were saying was interesting too. I can talk because then uh, I also once was talking to someone else who's a scientist about how they see their own maybe not scientific stories within the their scientific work. And do you ever think of stories when you're doing your practice? <laughs> <laughs> I can also to talk about um my story my story I'll go short uh Yes, so then I wanted, from what I talked about in the presentation, how to bring these stories together. So I made this fictionalized narrative that's set in a factory where they're producing products that are made from cyanobacteria. Um, and actually now it's transforming into a whole musical that I'm really excited for. Um, and actually it's what I'll do on the 7th of July with a friend. And together we kind of, create her character as well because I have the songs and the story but we will create together the backstory and she's like the artist and I'm the factory worker because the idea is that there's a gallery next door to the factory and they are yeah, confronted with each other art and science <laughs> maybe I have a like little question for you like I heard you use Seneca Corpus for your Seneca so why did you choose that stream or like just you got it by a, a coincidence? What I could find on eBay at the time. <laughs> Next time, tell me, I can provide you. <laughs> you eBay. Okay. eBay even can buy send bacteria. Okay, I will find them. <laughs> okay, if you don't have any questions or comments from the uh, room, actually, I would like to uh, welcome back. Uh, Professor Dr. Michelle Christian to just uh, continue with the end of this panel. So first of all, I think, thank you so much for your presentations and for the discussion. I think we could start first by giving them a hand. And then as a last little thing before we go to the coffee break, uh, we would like to take you over just to the other side of the garden here. It's a two minute walk to the Berlin Open Lab where we're working since we have you all here. Um, and then we would hand over to some of the students which would shortly tell you about their projects or give you a little inlet into some of the, the thoughts behind them. And uh, another motivation is that I believe they made fresh coffee which is now in the Berlin Open Lab. <laughs> And uh, we'll have a, a break then from 4 to 4.30, a coffee break. So if you want to bring your cups with you, you bring your cups with you. Okay. Oh, and you can, um, Pablo and Berkai, raise your hands. The, okay, the guys waving there, you can follow them. <laughs> Hello again. Okay, this is a message for our live stream audience. We will be back at 6.30 Berlin time, around 40, 50 minutes later. Ciao.
Is this on, Mina? So I have to turn it on. Hello? Not yet. Hello? Yes, okay, good. So we'll start again with our third and last panel today, Sonic Cyborgs. And we have four speakers, which will share with us, and then we'll have a discussion in the end. And our first speaker is Constanza Pina Pardo with the Kipo Project. And Constanza is a visual arts dancer and researcher focused on electronic experimentation, open technologies, and social practices. Her work reflects the role of machines in culture, criticizing capitalism, colonialism, and techno-patriarchy systems. She's interested in recycling, handicrafts, and electronic wizardry, and her work reflects the role of machines in our culture. She embodies the philosophy of open culture, nomadism, techno-feminism, and electronic anarchy. And she's also the founder of Cyborg Girls, Cyborg Girls, yeah, techno feminist meeting in Mexico City. And her work has been part of international festivals and spaces. A lot of them, just some of them are the Ars Electronica, the Media Lab Prado, the Media Lab in Mexico, um, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and Lab Collab in Taiwan. So, Constanza, we're very happy to have you with us, and I will give the floor straight over to you. Hello, um, thank you everybody uh, to be here and thank you Art Laboratory Berlin. Um, so today, today uh, I am going to talk about uh, research that uh, I start in 2013 when I was for first time here in Berlin. Uh, I know about Kipus for first time. Uh, this is a system that was used in, uh, in, during the Inca Empire. And all the pre-Columbian uh, cultures in South America. Um, and I don't know about that system before um, because the most of the, um, the kipus are uh, out of the origin, the ter territory. And the biggest collection of them is here in Berlin in Ecnological Museum. Um, now I am going to start to, to talk about kipus. Uh, kipus are book books not written on papers or mnemotechnic systems or information storage devices. And also we can define them as um, como like um, um, ancient computers, no? And also for a pre-Columbian culture uh, not uh, represent a social commitment or social pact no? for all society, all the society. Mm, here we can see pictures uh, from some kipus. Um, we can see spaces in between of the strings and also different shape of knots. 
and also this is another kind of kipu before the Inca Empire. Is this is the Wadi culture? It's different because it has an arc and also um, thread around the strings and different colors. And also uh, kipus are related to another system called the uh, yupana. We can see in that corner these uh, squares with uh, black and white uh, circles. Uh, oh, wait, it's not here. Well, sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, I lose a, a page. But now, um, bueno, la yupana is a, a mathematical system for a complex um, additions or, um, a, ¿cómo se dice? A, ya, olvidé la palabra. <laughs> Uh, it's for mathematics, no? But, uh, count and so now um, the characteristics and, stru and structures of kipus is it has a main rope or an arc that we can see in the picture before, and also the main rope has a, a big knot in the end. Uh, maybe it means uh, how is that kipu about, no? And, and also uh, hanging strings, and sometimes most strings hanging from that strings, and also different knots, long knots, a uh, different shape as an eight shape knot, or no, any knot means zero, number zero. And also it depends on the position of the knot in the strings, uh, represent unit 10, 100, thousands, or more than a thousand. Uh, and also spaces in between of the ropes and also the material or the color of the strings, uh, uh, the um, numeric, uh, they can have numerical or narrative information like stories or uh, numbers about how many people is in some area or animals or, and also there are another kind of kipuls uh, anormals, no? Como like different, we don't know what they say. And for my research, I keep my attention in astronomical skipus because they are like um, oracles mm -hmm. of the time. And now we can see a picture about these descriptions, the, the pendal cores and also subsidiary cores and also some cores are uh, hanging to up or down and different knots. Mm -hmm. And we can think about kipus as computers and with seven bits. No? So we have different levels in binary um, codification. Uh, for example, the material if is cotton or wool or color class. This is about uh, in Quechua culture. They uh, separate the colors as uh, if, if some colors are um, mixed with a violet, are from rainbow, uh, dark rainbow colors, no? Or if the, uh, the colors uh, have yellow, uh, it's another kind of rainbow, no? Also, it depends on twisted the strings or um, the direction of the knot, if it's due to right or left. And also numerical class. Uh, this is related to uh, even number or odd number. And also the type of information is codifying in the kipu, if they use decimal or not decimal numbers. Now we can see some images about that information before. Mm. And now I am going to talk about some contemporary references uh, around kipus because when I start my research, uh, I was thinking in uh, the idea, uh, uh, what if 
the colonizer never arrived in Latin America and the Kipul, the Kipus or our old technology, pre-Columbian technology still exists, no? So uh, uh, me and other artists also, we are in connection in South America, we talk about uh, Latin America science fiction, no? Or um, and, uh, Andean futurism. No? So uh, uh, I like this concept about, um, it's from uh, Jose Luis, Luis Jacome Guerrero and Noema Yorga from Ecuador, that, that they, they talk about uh, key punk. Uh, this is a concept like a stink punk. Um, and it's a retrofuturist fi philosophy and art uh, which based in percept on speculative science fiction and Andean Cosmo Vivencia uh, mixed with the, the aesthetic of a steampunk, punk. No? And they uh, talk about the um, technologies in Abyayala, no? Abyayala is the name of uh, all Latin America. Um, and they suggest kipus as uh, technologies, yeah, as punk <laughs> aspect, and also steam as the, the energy, no? Uh, because for us, um, our goddess, main goddess in, in uh, bueno, during the Inca Empire and in, in all South America is Viracocha, is the material of Viracocha is steam, no? So it's like an energy, a spiritual energy and life, no? Uh, so, um, um, Jose Luis uh, is like a messenger from the past, uh, and he's giving a kipu with a message, no? For the future. And this is another artist, is Patricia Cadavid from Colombia, that she developed an electronic kipu um, using conductive materials, and she play with this interface, sorry. And she's talking about another concept uh, called Kipunaira, because for the um, uh, pre-Columbian cultures, the past is in front of us, no? Because we, we can see our past and the future is behind. Mm -hmm. So as I said, she's talking about Kipunaira, Kipu, Kipu of the future time, no? But with an eye in the, uh, in the past, no? In front of the um, and also another um, artist is Paula Torres. Uh, she's using well, kipus in different ways. Uh, also, she play with kipus, and she talk about kipumancia, like um, uh, a divinatory technique uh, using kipus. You know, so I like to think in this. Um, a speculative way uh, about kipus because uh, we had this um, un uncertainty of our past, no? So uh, we take this speculative nar uh, narrative, speculativas, we can bring our culture uh, today. No? Uh, so another curious thing is, um, some chronists write um, that um, write uh, letters and some type of escritura um, uh, exist on the Ink Empire, uh, but they um, uh, uh, prohibit and only um, permit uh, limit the communication to uh, geometrical shapes and also kipus. Mm -hmm. and, and also I want to talk about uh, El Manifiesto Futurista Andino de Alan Poma, uh, that uh, he said the, uh, between the, uh, the observation of the movement of the start and constellation made them away the circle of nature, developing uh, the ability to predict astronomical phenomena. Um, and for that, uh, to celebrate this discovery, uh, architects, astronomers, engineers, and artists 
eh, ay, bueno, yo me quedo sobre. <risa> de, de, de developing the, the unique temples that were strategic places uh, to coincide with the star phenomenon, ¿no? So we are talking about a, an a old society where uh, the uh, wearables, elements, uh, urbanism, uh, architecture, temples, and as, are in the same way to, to read the future and the stars and, and also um, is a mathematical system, a cosmovision no? in the whole continent. Mm, so that in this many, in this manifesto, uh, we can think about a, a region full of past is also full of possible futures. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, in my research also, uh, I think about uh, how is the um, uh, computer science today in relation with in, um, textiles and, and also uh, astronomy um, is related with uh, computers no? today. So this is uh, for me is a good reference uh, because the Har uh, women Harvard computers are women that uh, they uh, create uh, the system uh, to classificate a star. And in that moment in Harvard, there are no computers, but they are the computer. No? Uh, and also uh, Adalo Lance is the first person in the world. No, it's not the first woman, it's the first person that she developed um, a code and she developed this code uh, thinking in this machine is a loom machine also for textiles no and this machine used this um ah, pun, 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 card <laughs> Um, and from this, uh, it's from this code and uh, using the reference of uh, the Loom machine, uh, that is the first computer. No, it's the first computer. Is uh, take that references to uh, exist. No, um, so for that, uh, I like to think all our computer that we use today. Uh, are created uh, taking um, textiles as references, also women works. No? And also I like this uh, reference because it's the little old ladies memories. Uh, they are a group of women that uh, they, they made the Rome memories for Apollo mission. Mm -hmm. And it's really like a textile. And they change the name, like not ROM memories, as LOL memories, because it's it, the, the work of them. No? So now <clears throat> I am showing some pictures about my installation. This research. Um, has a, a laboratory that I, I teach, uh, I share my, my research with others, with a group of women called uh, Melissa Aguilar, Daniela Sofia Main, Ana Ortiz, Ana Cervantes, and me. So the idea was uh, to create a kipo uh, because we're reading a book. If you really want to understand a kipo, you have to do one with your hands, no? Because at the time, uh, as this uh, performance that when you do count with your finger and your brain, uh, you are part of the computer. No, your body is part of the computer, and you, you if you do that as a as a mantra, you can really understand uh, what kipu is. 
for that. I like that reference uh, of uh, women computers because they are the computer. Your body, your time, and your brain is part of the computer. So we do that exercise and we take the classification system of the star of the Harvard computers is this, is with um, letters and we use that letter uh, as an ASCII code and we mix with a decimal system and also a binary system to understand Kipu not today and to classify information in our own Kipu. So for that, we have to create a new uh, algorithm and, co and codification, uh, taking information from different um, sources. No? So also I um, create some electronic circuits, uh, DIY. Uh, they are some, um, MF, electromagnetic fields amplifier. E, so we was creating a astronomical kipu, and so that constellation is the name is Votes. That was the constellation. Uh, what we have uh, on, uh, bueno, over us uh, during the laboratory when we developed the kipu. Uh, so we think uh, to keep that information uh, in our people. So just we write, we have, um, we write on the people we codify. Uh, today, me Constanza, I am under this star here. Uh, you no, know? is that the information that we? Codify in our kipu. So this is the constellation, and I create a DIY circuit taking this um, shape, and this is the, the my PCB, my circuit board. And then this is the, the installation, is uh, 180 strings uh, mixed. Uh, with alpaca wool and conductive thread, copper thread. Mm -hmm. So every string is connected with this uh, circuit board. Uh, and behind of the circuit board is an electromagnetic field amplifier. And then I need a sound system. So the idea with this installation is to do like a big antenna with conductive thread and then uh, amplify the um, the sound, uh, the electromagnetic field surround the uh, the installation. Uh, the idea was because kipu means not, and noise means like talking not, no? because today we cannot read how is written or codified on kipus, but for me it was important to be in, in, in a sensible space with the kipu and the person and we can do some uh, sensible experience and talk with our kipu. No? So this is picture of the first installation and the people can walk around. And then the, the Kipu was in Arts Electronica and has an honorary mention. And for me, was I am super proud because this is a group of women that uh, we do a, a ritual in Mexico to celebrate this uh, because it's for me super important uh, Latin American women rep representation in that uh, kind of festivals. Uh, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we're going to continue with the thoughts and then bring everyone up in the end for your questions. So our next speaker is Nayeli Vega and everything okay? Nayeli is a Mexican artist and designer based and working in Berlin. And her work focuses on topics related to feminism, ecology, social justice and speculative design. 
Her artistic practice explores rituals and technologies of the past, present, and future through digital and analog mediums, such as digital 3D modeling and fabrication, weaving, knots, installations, amongst others. She's been awarded the Elsa Neumann Scholarship of the Berlin Senate, and she's co-founder and member of the Lacuna Lab e.V., um, an international artist collective in Berlin Kreuzberg that brings together a wide range of projects on the intersection of art and technology. And seeing each other after eight years, we realized that Nayeli actually took a class with Florian and I a decade ago. So we're very excited to see what you're working on now. Welcome, Nayeli. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it is a delight for me to participate in this event, um, especially after uh, listening to Constanza. Um, it is uh, just, yeah, so it is just um, for me super incredible. I'm going to talk to you about uh, my journey with this project, which is happening in Europe. So I am um, a non-European um, designer and which is um, an important uh, fact when I am working with this project. So Coatsy Knots, it is a project investigating the relation of pre-colonial textile-based information technology and modern day digital design. Based on the observation that in many pre-colonial cultures, textiles have been used to store and transmit data and information, the project aims at the transfer of such, such technologies into the digital age by creating connections between pre-colonial and modern day knowledge system. And with this project, I explored the functionality of the kipus. Um, uh, I want to also uh, say that with this project, um, I want to promote the colonial and a feminist perspective on the field of design, which I consider that needs to be changed from the structures. Um, So I will start saying that um, this quote from Matteo Pasquinelli, uh, claiming that abstract techniques of knowledge and artificial metalanguages belong uniquely to the modern industrial West is not only historically inaccurate, but also act as one of the implicit epistemic, epistemic colonialism towards cultures of other places and other times. Um, this quote uh, also motivates me a lot to understand what is communication and what is language. Um, when I was making my, um, this is part of my um, initial research for my master um, thesis, I am trained as a textile designer. I wanted to know more about, um, specifically about how textiles have been used through history to transmit information, uh, either qual quantitative or qualitative. So, um, because um, I made a, a research on kipus and um, I, I consider that I will focus right now in this part of the kipu, which is the knot, which was um, something that I became very interested because um, I started to read about knots and knotting, knotting techniques, uh, which were using a long history by many uh, cultures, as, and it's one of the oldest techniques to attach objects. I'm going to quote um, Semper, um, an architect that said, it's one of the oldest techniques for attaching objects to another, uh, one to another, and constructing more complex structures out of single entities. The knotting of linear fiber, fibers is considered to be historical starting point of textile techniques and architecture. Um, Besides their material function as structuring elements, knots can also contain a strong symbolism. Such symbolism can be abstract when, for example, when using the term knots and knotting as metaphors for the connectivity and interrelatedness of the social and natural world, but also very concrete as in the case of textile devices, devices using knots as a form of code for the purposes of encrypting data and information. Um, with the kipu, as we saw uh, in the previous presentation, 
the Andean people um, develop knotted cords to record information. Such uses of knotted cords as information carriers has been a common practice among pre-Columbian societies and prevail, still prevail after the colonial period. Um, in my research, I found other examples. Uh, for example, the so-called time ball, which is a knotted device used by the women of the North American Yakama tribe to describe important life events of their family members, as well as the string figure games used to preserve and tell the stories of the Navajo people. Um, and in fact, according to the researcher Frank Salomon, that many, many indigenous people of the Americas use knotted techniques to materialize narratives about their perception of the world and the cosmos. And actually, I just learned that, for example, string games were also or are still used by um, uh, in Australia by indig indigenous uh, Aboriginal people in Australia. Um, so in my research of, on, on the kipus, I chose to work, I was making a research on how they were working. And I found out that there are three main knots in the kipus. Um, this is a, a, a diagram take from Asher and Asher. And then I started, as Constanza said, it's necessary to start knotting and recreate these knots to understand how they work. Uh, in my research, my research uh, becomes very fictional in the way I started to think how to create messages, how to encode um, stories, for example. And um, I started to think how to work with digital technologies um, because I wanted to understand how to co-create with the machines, for example. Um, with this and these images, uh, you can see it's my first attempt of materialized um, knotting technique. And here you can see it contains the, um, the single knot and other knots that then I, I made with the computer and then I 3D printed. With this project, I analyzed people's physical properties from a design perspective to then present an, an, a framework to encode narratives into three-dimensional surfaces using digital media and additive manufacturing. This attempt is rooted in three critical perspectives on design that form the project's analytical framework and can be described as the colonial, feminist, and also personal. The colonial perspective refers from the notion that history and historical artifacts from any kind and materials have for many years been predominantly interpreted from a colonizer perspective that tend to neglect other languages, cultures, and knowledge systems. So, um, well, also, um, I want to point out that knowledge and about digital technologies can also exist out of the structural power relations that foster an unequal distribution of the means to influence and control technological development. Understanding that these relations are heavily organized around gender and gender stereotypes, this work as well takes a feminist perspective. So on my analysis of the kipus, um, I was uh, following the research from Gary Orton, um, saying um, mostly taking like what are the material um, properties that would be important to consider when uh, trying to interpret the kipus. For example, the material, the color of the course, the spin, the ply, the direction of the knots, the positioning of course, the type of knot, the thread color and color lens, and there are more. But then I take a uh, for my purpose of my project, I take physical and digital properties for my project, which is the material. And this, uh, in this stage of my project, I chose to work with the material, with the color, with the knot type, with the knot direction, with the texture, and the, with, the, with the elasticity. Um, these are some diagrams also following the research from Gary Orton and other researchers about the 
the notation, the numerical notations into the nodes. Um, the X represents empty spaces, the X is the one, and then two, three, four, five, until nine. Um, and then I uh, started to create my diag diagrams on how to create other kind of knots, uh, which for example, I am making the diagram of the knot number nine and how to start creating other shapes. Um, and here, um, I am going to talk specifically about the knots. Knotting is defined as a method of fastening linear material by tying or interweaving, whereas I'm going to explain what happened here. So I, dis I, I selected uh, these three main knots in the kipu, which is a single knot, the figure eight knot, and the long knot, and then started to create equivalences when closing the knots and creating abstract knots, and then um, find out that there are equivalences with mathematical knots, which um, this exists in the Euclidean space. So the kipus are a three-dimensional way of uh, encoding information. And for me, this resulted where, uh, this results in a um, in an interest that I developed for the rest of the project because I was thinking on how to take to the three dimensionality this this um, these knots because knots themselves are three dimensional. Um, some other thing that I wanted to to explore because as a study um, there are some um, uh, points that I want to to tell is that I was based on on using um, open source software as processing or blender or forward um, in the next slides you will see that uh, other specific software like not plot uh, for me this was very important because it's the ethos of the project to work uh, with tools that are available for me and for other women who wants to experiment with technology uh, in the moment when I was a, a, stu a student, we, we could uh, experiment with softwares where we need to pay, but I, I, I tried to work with Blender even if that meant to learn in other direction, which means unlearn. If you, if you are experienced in working with 3D, then uh, learning uh, Blender is disconnect from the structure and then connect to another structure, which was very attractive for me because precisely my, my project is about unlearn so many things, unlearn to read, unlearn to write, unlearn to code. <laughs> so this, is, this was very playful for me. So this is a, an experiment on how to create the knots in processing because I wanted to learn processing and I didn't want it to be intimidated by the code. So um, the resulting corpse, I was then able to 3D print them and I wanted to play, play with the 3D printers and I wanted to just print with different materials and prove elasticity because, because precisely when I saw you, show you the first slides, I was very interested on in the functionality and in all these pro physical properties. Um, so with the, with the next stage, then I started to think how to work, uh, how to put words into, into these surfaces. And I started, uh, I am very inspired by different authors and different books. Uh, for example, the Senate Feminist Manifesto, uh, where, uh, um, I, I put in a software to get, like there is the softwares where you can get mainly used in social media to get the most important words or, or topics um, that are during the day, like circulating during the day. And um, I got um, from this book, the 10, the most ten, the, the 10 most important words used uh, as gender, labor, feminist, technologies, world, freedom, political, alienation, bodies, and complexity, which this, with these words I felt identify. So then I started, uh, I started to play on how to create codes into these knots and to give sense to, to start to write. Um, and you can see here is a diagram where I to, to, to make codes like manually to assign codes. 
and then start to think how would I put this, for example, how do I embed words into surfaces? And for example, saying that one knot is going to contain one chapter of a book, let's say. Resulting in this, that I assign to each property of the knot, uh, for example, color, texture, size, um, topology, then I translate them, give an, an equivalence to a word. And then I was thinking, um, I was following again the research from Gary Urton, um, which is uh, where, when, where he is investigating how to translate the quipus, how to understand the grammatics of the quipus, because precisely um, the understanding of the quipus, it is from a structure, from a different structure of thinking, of language, and this. Uh, classification belongs to uh, ethno categories of service in the Inca uh, tribute account. And uh, it's classifying um, some verbs and objects of activity that supposedly were encoded into tribut tributarian quipus. That said, uh, quipus to pay tribute. Um, and you can see there are a list of verbs and to the verbs corresponds objects, objects of activity that said, for example, nouns. And then I started creating my own list of combinatorial categories, which it means verbs uh, related to objects of the activity. And precisely because of my feminist per perspective, I started to think how to give a meaning to these knots. Uh, let's say, for example, to make world, to make complexity, to make craft, to make history, to make tools. And this is always related to the way we are making our own, our own histories, our, our own artifacts, how do we create our own tools. And uh, I started to create a series of knots where I, I was playing uh, all these projects about playing on, with words, with the language, with the meanings said that you can see with these knots, I can just use a verb and noun and a noun, for example, to say to reveal stories, to subvert structures, to generate possibilities. And then um, writing with knots and the design of coded surfaces. Um, I have to quote Donna Haraway because I felt very in, um, identified with this. Uh, it matters what matters we use to think other matters with. It matters what stories we tell to tell stories with. It matters what knots, not knots, what thugs, things thugs, what descriptions describe descriptions, what ties, tie ties. It matters what stories make worlds, what worlds make stories. So because of this fic fictional approach I am taking, then I was also trying to create a set of knots that would be um, different, but they are all aligned with the idea of creating a feminist way of communicating and even a fictional language. Um, and all these diagrams were three-dimensionalized three into meshes of knots. For me, it was very important also to play with the textures of, uh, of, my, of these elements because the textures, everything in these objects is a meaning and um, I wanted to create textures that were also like very attractive and fictional. So imagining that we had artifacts that we can read digitally, but not digi digitally with computers, but digitally with our fingers. And uh, these are some of the results of my physical experiments. And then also trying to start create, let's say, this uh, to intertwine words as a stories. In another stage of my project, I started to play with uh, artificial intelligence tools, uh, GPT-2. I'm going to read this text. A Mexican feminist friend gave me the word. She called it llegar a ser, that moment of arrival when something slips into place, fits comfortably, and suddenly you know, you just know that this is what I should be doing. Um, the author is GPT-2, because I was also thinking what kind of stories do I want to tell 
or who is going to tell the stories or like in this case, who is controlling the computer and what the computer is also saying and doing. Um, that is why I felt attracted to play also with GPT-2 and also the, the, the teachable machine where it's also recognizing the, the nodes. I am assigning values to the, um, sorry, uh, meanings or words to the nodes and are, these are read by machines. This is a continuation in other project, uh, not a conversation that it's um, apart from this project. And I, I have this, is, this story. It's also another way of writing. Um, it talks um, in this part, this comes the personal perspective of being a designer in another uh, country with another language. And um, this uh, text was also generated in GPT-2, was almost accurate as, a, as, if, as if a human was writing, but I changed some of the words again. Then I was thinking how to translate this text into knots, into a series of meshes. And I was creating a kind of dictionary or like a tables where I was assigning uh, meanings to, to uh, I was assigning words to, to knots uh, by color, by direction of the knot, and by material. And this is based in this data book, uh, code, of, code of the Kipu data book from Marcia Asher and Robert Asher, which inspired me to create my own data book. Yeah. And this is the result uh, of, my, of the mesh where the story I show you in the beginning is encoded and it was 3D printed. Um, thank you. Very beautiful. Thank you so much, Nayeli. Um, then we will have our third speakers, which this time will be digitally. Um, we'll have Leslie Garcia and Paloma Lopez, two of the members of Interspecifics. And Interspecifics is a multi-species nomad collective and independent artistic research bureau founded in Mexico City in 2013. Their current lines of research are focused on the use of sound and artificial intelligence to understand the bioelectrical and chemical signals of different living organisms and its geometrical patterns as a non-human form of communication. Their work is deeply shared by Latin American contexts where precarity enables new forms of creativity and ancient technologies meet cutting edge forms of production, which they see as a methodology for creation where one is always looking for the most suitable way to produce in terms of social inclusion, cross-disciplinary practices and open knowledge. And Leslie and Paloma, I believe also just shared a uh, guest professorship for computer music at the TU Berlin in the last semester. And welcome to both of you. Um, screen sharing works and we're very excited to hear what you have to tell us. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, I am Leslie Garcia and this is Paloma Lopez. Just one and second, we just yes. have to fix the audio, you're not very loud. Okay. Shall I turn this off? Um, can you try to say something? Okay, hello, can you hear me? Perfect, yes. Okay, excellent. So, um, my name is Leslie Garcia and my colleague Palome Lopez. Uh, we're going to present on behalf of, of the Mexican Collective Interspecifics. Maybe we can go to the next screen. And uh, this is the collective Carles Tardillo, Felipe Rebolledo, Alfredo Lozano, Emanuel Anguiano, and you have the, the luck to have with you Maro Pebo right now. She's around there somewhere. Um, Nick Clifford, uh, Paloma Lopez and I. So today we're going to talk about the theoretical aspects of our project Codex Virtualis. And I'm also going to guide you through uh, the technical process of the AI and their implications on today's technology. Uh, first, um, I want to show you uh, Codex Virtualis is a long run process that is divided into four stages. Right now we are on the first stage, the genesis of the organisms. And we are starting the second part, which is uh, habitat. 
uh, where we try to explore external inputs and environmental conditions into the already uh, born organisms. Then we have Codex Virtualis Emergence, uh, which is more a real-time microscopy experiment to explore complexity on life. And finally, uh, our dream, which is to uh, sustain a virtual life for a long time on a, on a virtual conditions, which is vir Codex Virtualis Life. So Codex Virtualis is an AI and art and science research framework for image synthesis of a taxonomic collection of a new to nature speculative life forms. In a way, this is our tribute to the work and life of Lynn Margules and his work on symbiogenesis, which inspires us to explore uh, this whole process on a collective context and think about symbiosis is not just as a life process, but also as a computational process and a collaborative creative uh, emergence that we're trying to reproduce on our work. Uh, it's an exploration of morphogenetic visual patterns that inhabit halfway the biological and the algorithmic life domains. Um, the work as a research framework has a series of outputs. Uh, one of those are the installations. Uh, we presented the first one at Ars Electronica, then another one at Chrono Center. Maybe we can go through the installation images. Uh, also, Chrono Center in Shanghai, the Ground Solyanka Gallery in Moscow, the A4 Museum in Chengdung, uh, right now at the Art Laboratory in Berlin, and Galleria Metropolitana in Mexico City. Uh, but Codex is uh, rather the process, the publication, the booklet, the workshop, is a constant understanding of ongoing collective processes that we are trying to explore. Um, the project uh, creates an exploration of algorithmic life, experimenting with uh, algorithmic behaviors that are comparable to the mechanisms of life. Uh, we try to explore evolution, not from competition, but from the collaboration and exchange of biological and algorithmic systems, such as the mixed trained of organs with two qualitative different data sets, that merge leading to the emergency of new visual samples analogous to the original gene transfer uh, progressively fitting novel definitions of life. Uh, for us, in order to be uh, capable to produce this process, first we have to explore the biological level. Uh, in this case, this uh, level was uh, a proposal from Maro that we start exploring uh, some organisms from the realm of uh, astrobiology. So for this, we try to extract some of the challenges of stream space environments uh, that are proposed by the SETI Institute, which were one of our um, partners and collaborators during the first stage of this uh, project that was uh, awarded with the AI residency uh, by Ars Electronica. So we explored some of these challenges as some of them high levels of UV, the ionization radiation and dryness being some of the main uh, problems. Then we created a selection of species, uh, extremophiles, that um, express some specific characteristics for resilience. Uh, UV light resistance, radiation resistance, spore resistance to desiccation, and also the symbiotic interspecies survival uh, capacities. That's the next slide, please. And from this, we extract some learnings uh, from these organisms, uh, which are protection, repairing, uh, and the exchange of spores. So these are some levels of symbiosis that we want to transfer to these uh, new organisms we are trying to create in our system. Um, as an artificial uh, life artistic research project, uh, Codex Virtualis, seeks to enhance our understanding of the genetic, metabolic and behavioral processes of life 
by means of carefully articulating a display of scientific theories represented by a multi-layer ecosystem of interconnected collaborative computer simulation strategies. Uh, this is important because we are also thinking that the uh, algorithms and the programs within our systems are themselves creating their own symbiotic processes. Uh, as such, this is uh, concerned with a bottom-up scientific study of the fundamental principles of life. Honoring computer and scientist uh, Chris Longston, uh, we seek to locate life as we know it within the larger picture of life as it could be. In the first step of Codex Virtualis, uh, the genesis part, the technical processes are conceptualized into three main layers. Uh, although the limiting boundary is blurred as we approach the assembling and interaction of this, uh, which are devising to perform one, which is the synthesis uh, of biological and artificial forms of life. Uh, two, the explore, exploration and operation of the synthesis layer. And the third is the assemble of a display of outputs to produce uh, that are, they are producing layers one and two. So the life form synthesis, uh, we can uh, is the fundamental process in the staging, the training of our style gang two, uh, which is the generative adversarial network, a very famous and popular network that are used uh, today in many. Uh, creative and artistic proposals. Uh, we train our GAN networks to synthesize morphological features of our four data sets, such as the NARO uh, from the NARO Gene Bank, uh, a public data collection from Japan, the LENIA uh, Cellular Automata, uh, which is a collection of solitons in continuous cellular automata, uh, the AWA network, uh, uh, crowdsource collection of images, uh, most of them from Instagram, most of them from biologists uh, that are sharing their daily research on their microscopes and they were very kind to share those images with us. And of course, the model organism, which is the collection of extreme condition resilient organisms inspired by the astrobiological research. We decide to use cellular automata as a representative model organism to transfer uh, behavior to our artificial forms of life. Uh, so two different training processes are performing this conceptual layer, which are the training of the network that is made from scratch on one of the image data sets and the training uh, of a network from a previously training check checkpoint we, that we use as a transfer learning. Uh, the previous image, please. So the role of transfer learning becomes crucial in our research as we speculate for possible forms of life. Uh, in this image, you can look at a set of organisms which were generated by transfer learning of the AWA dataset into model organisms and the LENIA dataset. This means that we use the dataset of uh, AWA or water and we transfer the characteristics of water into the form model organisms. And you can see in the image uh, how the systems starts to evolve and transfer uh, those particular characteristics from the model organisms into the AWA datasets, as well as the LENIA, uh, which for us is uh, super important because it's the virtual organism that has the capacity, the, the ability to transfer uh, behavior and some um, evolving uh, references into the system. This project is the analogy that in, in the artificial genetic modeling, symbiotic evolution is often described by genetic fusion operators within a genotype representation level. In organ architectures, coevolution is implemented by the GANS discriminator versus generator game theoretical interplay, to which at a pheno phenotypical level, information exchange, imitation, and deception 
constitutes a primordial set of inner interactions that lead to a divergent, continuously evolving representation of visual forms. It further allows to explicit represent an information transfer between domains, analogous to the origin that gene transfer mechanisms in biology. So in the next images, uh, we're going to play three videos uh, to explain a little bit about the checkpoint evolution that we are using at this point. Uh, we can play three of them at the same time. So in this case, it's three stages of the same organism uh, in different moments. Uh, we can see a young, uh, middle age, and an uh, older uh, cell evolving uh, even evolving limbs at the end of the process, uh, which we find uh, super interesting. And I'm going to explain a little bit about how we manage to remove the randomness of, of the Latin walk of uh, the gangs by exploring other algorithms. Uh, so here you can see some of these uh, evolutionary processes. In the next slide, we have also uh, the transfer of uh, lichen into uh, algae. Maybe we can play the next one, yes. So again, uh, three stages, same organism, and we can see the departure from a more uh, algae kind of a style a structure into a lichen structure and then the dissolution of the cell uh, born uh, growth and death of the virtual organism in a way maybe we can go to the the next one the number two representation so in order for us to be capable to produce these sort of uh, evolutionary systems, uh, maybe next one, I think is okay with the video examples. Okay. So representation, exploration, and generation of this Latin work, which is the main uh, visual feature of transformation in gangs. Uh, so to extend the, the generative possibilities of our trainer gangs in this layer, we are concerned with the manipulation, exploration, and control of image generating procedures. So by taking the Latin space as a genetic encoding that maps into various phenotype expressions uh, through G projects the analogy that changes in the gene pool of a population, which is the genotype expression, produces a continuous stream of novel organism, which is the phenotype expression. In this state, uh, an exploration of vectorial properties relative to position direction and magnitude of the Latin space is meant to identify and represent relationships between visual attributes and the Latin space region that generates them. So instead of going into a random uh, position of different vectors in the Latin space, uh, we have to develop this tool to explore the space and find coordinates that can be interconnected and give us a more steady and stable uh, evolution process on the virtual organism. And supervised representation and autonomous exploration become a matter of integrating computer vision, statistical and machine learning algorithms. So this results is, a, is an in silico evolutionary architecture that further explores different algorithm recipes under which the biological concepts of variation, heredity, fusion, and cooperation can aesthetically manifest themselves and lead to in novo hybrid morphological profiles. So number two, representation, exploration, and generation, which is the image uh, we are seeing here. 
Uh, after the Latin place exploration, uh, this entanglement becomes a crucial step to enact the synthesized morphological features on the first layer. So in this figure, we can see two different taxonomical classes that are autom autonomously discovered by a clustering algorithm. Each cluster algori algorithm assigns each image family taxon ID or level, where organisms in the same taxon share visual characteristics such as shape, contour, color, and texture. Through this combination of Latin vectors, we come to a formulate a map of regions in the Latin space, uh, where configurations of similar visual features are maintaining through a gamma feature. The resulting taxonomy serves as a twofold purpose. First, it allows us to get a grasp of the diversity of forms that are synthesized and emerge from interpolation of organs and learning processes to represent and generate a training image instances. Second, induces an augmented representation of morphological features that other algorithm process can integrate into generative procedures. Uh, next image, please. So from here, uh, we propose two distinct mechanisms to generate video clips and trajectories into the Latin space that we call cycles, which takes as an input uh, the sets of two topets that consist of Latin vectors and their assigned cluster of taxons into newly generated organisms that show an organized uniform and continuous behavior. Uh, the distinction between these two is interesting because class A cycles come from an autonomous algorithm that encodes evolutionary process of heredity and selection. And class B cycle comes from an algorithm that embraces human machine collaboration by enhancing the human operator's capabilities to transverse the Latin space and integrates a finite criterion. So it's similar like uh, selecting the best uh, species of plants in a, a plant house or looking for the fittest bacteria in a laboratory, but this happens in a virtual context. Now, the last layer in this computational ecosystem is concerned with the assemble of the display from the output of the first and second layer. So in the image, you can see a capture of a three-dimensional body, uh, some sort of soft shield that is done by drawing points in a 3D environment, which use the cycle video on layer two as a procedural texture. The process allows to abandon the two-dimensional space of the style gang, uh, and uh, we allow us to organize and receive environmental inputs and response by resha res reshaping this soft chill. So this is a way to um, create um, extra layer of algorithmic behavior in the gang. You can also see that on the left portion of the synthetic genome that we generated using language model training with zero-shot learning and a database of 16x and 18x ribosomal RNA sequences from model organisms. So this is an hybrid that has 50% of the DNA from the previous parents and 50% of generative um, network uh, DNA. And last, you can see this organism is being tagged with scientific name that was also generated by an algorithm in this layer. Uh, next image, through this uh, procedural layer, we assemble an array of ways that allows, to, uh, allows the spectator to get an immersing glimpse into the diverse possibility of forms of life in the Codex Virtualis Genesis. And in the next image, we can see the sample display, uh, the last but not least, uh, system of control, which allows us to select a specific organism inside the Latin space. And this is also a, um, a step that is performed by a, another network, another kind of artificial intelligence that is in a way looking into the archive and presenting to the human spectators these different uh, sort of cards of life that are emerging from the process.
Uh, we're gonna play a little bit of a trailer uh, because it's a little bit long, but so you can have an idea of the aesthetics. Of course, you can visit their laboratory and have a better uh, experience. I think we can stop there. So the project belongs to a cultural and artistic history of automatas. Um, humanity's age-old quest for mechanical life and its contemporary re redemptions in the field of artificial life e-life as computational simulations. It also focuses on values of collaborations and exchange in the quest for diversity and survival, both in algorithms as in microbial life. Uh, when it comes to the field of artificial intelligence, the integration of neural networks, computer vision mechanisms, and traditional machine learning algorithms into a semantic coupling that seeks to represent symbiotic relationships promotes a neo-animistic conception that is proposed to antagonize the widespread mechanization conception of AI that imitates and somehow preserves the alienated mechanization of human labor and capitalist societies. This neo-animistic conception considers that through a repositioning uh, of distributed agency, we can picture AI as a free form and assume an intelligence based on a human measure, as well as seeing machine intelligence as a agentic entity of another order capable of subjectivity um, other than that of humans. And this is uh, our project. I want to thank uh, Maro Pebo and Alfredo Lozano for putting together this presentation. I want to thank also Paloma Lopez uh, for uh, being on charge of the research process of this project and of course the whole team. And thank you, everyone, for having us uh, virtually. We really want to be there at some point. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And yes, we look forward to next time, hopefully, live. Um, so a last but not least of our speakers today is a third uh, member of Interspecifics is Maro Pebo, who is an artist, an art historian, work, whose work aims to release the indiscipline of living cells. Maro is born in Mexico City, has a PhD in creative media from the City University of Hong Kong, and an MA in critical and gender studies from Bologna University. Weaving collaborations, Maro works on defying anthropocentrism and on skeptical environmental accountability. Her transdisciplinary work complements and transforms the responsibility of the life sciences to think about biological matter. She's also been involved a lot in Bach society, for instance, and um, we're very, very happy to have Maro here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for enduring this long day. We heard a lot of words. We had a lot of concepts already. So I would try to be short and sweet and entertaining as much as I can. 
uh, to keep your energy for this moment. I really don't like to be behind this. I'll try to be obedient. What I want to present today is the feminist traditions behind cyborg kingship in art. What I'm trying to say today we heard, and we are all in this audience very familiar with notions of sim like symbiosis, right? Or endosymbiosis or the non-human, the post-human, the post-human turn, uh, non-human subjectivities. Everyone in this audience is very familiar with them, but what I want to think today is the importance of acknowledging what is the origin of these ideas. And not only what is the feminist origin of these ideas, today I'm gonna to focus on the uh, cyborg manifesto that is familiar to us, but, but maybe these ideas are also a good starting point of orientation to think about all of these new works that we are developing with trans species thinking and symbiosis thinking, and we can orient them to, to contain and to preserve their political potential. So this is what I want to present to you today. So as I said before, and today, all day, we have been looking at Moist Media works that establish these interspecies inter relations. Right now, we have an environmental urgency that makes it that so many works are working with these notions, with these concepts of this post-anthropocentric turn that we all have been thinking. So what I'm, well, my proposal and the center of my idea that I want to test with you today is the idea that these artworks that we are constructing and we're dealing with embody the cyborg manifesto. So Donna Haraway wrote this radical manifesto in 1985. And what she's proposing is that the cyborg is a myth. You know, she's constructing it a myth that later derives in the idea of these science fictions, science frictions, and, but it's also a metaphor. But the metaphor then becomes a figuration that will be embodied in the works that we are developing from art and biology. And what she's proposing in the Cyborg Manifesto is a set of tools to overturn existing domain structures. This is exactly the political uh, dimension that I would like to recover and to sustain later uh, with the works in the present. So she's talking about race, she's talking about class, and she's talking about social realities. She's not just talking about the beauty of the fungi being friends with the cyanobacteria, but there's all of these other implications that are very present and powerful in the Cyber Manifesto. So there is a joint kinship with animals and machines that belongs to this traditional of uh, potential of action. So, in, so I have seen what I have said, there's two main ideas from the Cyborg Manifesto that I think we need to acknowledge and that we could work with, which is art that embodies this organism machine continuum. Again, this is something we super take for granted, right? But in the 85, Haraway is talking about how to dissolve dualisms, which has become like something that we work with every day. And, and the most important dualisms are these ideas of culture and nature, you know, this idea of the artificial, or when we say, oh, we want to you know, save nature, you know, the, we're completely solving this notion of nature uh, between the, what is biological, what's technological, and what is me and what is the other, which is also something very important for everyone who's working with microorganisms, for example. And, and what, what this continuum uh, from the Cyborg Manifesto also refers to is this deep endosymbiotic relation. We are thinking, for example, in moist media, which is a mixture. This is a concept as described by Roy Ascot. She's thinking about something that is simultaneously hardware, is algorithm and living cells, right? So a little bit what we have seen with interspecifics, what they're uh, working with. We are working with. <laughs> Embody. Um, and the second concept that comes from the Cyborg Manifesto that we should acknowledge, but also work with for the future is embodying the post-anthropocentric turn, all right? So I take for granted that everyone here knows what the post-anthropocentric turn is. Uh, and just in case one person is not, I'm gonna quote uh, my favorite philosopher, Rosie Baidori, that she says is we're thinking about a process of confronting the thinkability of life that doesn't have me or any other human at the center. And this is very sobering. It's an instructive process, and this post-anthropocentric shift is a start for an ethics of sustainability. So those who were in my workshop a couple of weeks ago, we were thinking, how can we have an ethics of sustainability that is critical, you know, that we're not naive, because we don't, we need to move beyond naiveness in this process, and how can we have uh, like a critical ethics of sustainability. So 
So when we're thinking about embodying the post interpersonal turn that the Cyborg Manifesto was already proposing in 85, we can think about the notion of making kin. How can we make kin? Uh, in terms of how, as, as Harway presents it, but also it is understood as feminist posthumanism from Rosie Bredotti. And I think for me, the key of, of it is the politics of affinity and accountability in affectionate ties. How do we build affectionate ties with each other, with all the others, with all possible others? And for me, the key is there in this affectionate affinity and accountability. And, and what Haraway is proposing is this renewed kinship system. Right, so this radicalized by concretely affectionate ties to the non-human others. My favorite, the micros. Uh, <laughs> so we're thinking, when we're thinking about these artworks, about these speculative fabulations. We are dreaming of the connection. We are dreaming of the possibility of being with each other, but this is grounded by the biotechnological materiality. So our artworks are not science fiction because in our artworks, really, you know, the process, uh, metabolic process of fermentation is warming up the bioreactor, for example, in the work of, of, of Oron that he showed us earlier. So we are really limited by the materiality. If it doesn't warm up enough, you know, the bioreactor is not going to be able to have the cells, keep, keep the cells alive. So we are, our, our fabulations, our fictions are bounded and grounded on the materiality of the things that we're working with. So we are thinking with the machine and we're thinking with my biological matter. It's, this is, is a different process of thinking with the object itself. I brought some examples, but today we have seen so many artworks that I don't know if it makes sense anymore. Um, Gilberto Esparza, Mexican artist. And the only thing I'm gonna tell you about this wonderful artwork besides hear it, it sounds beautiful. I, I brought examples of works that have sound because we are in the Sonic Cyborg panel mainly, and that's the reason. And, but I wanted to speak about uh, microbial fuel cells uh, as a form of cyborg endosymbiosis because in them, bacteria are releasing electrons and they are ex exchanging with the cell, with the machine as, as, as the some sort of mitochondria, right? And this is the kind of electrons that are being collected by devices as BioSonot by Gilberto Esparza. And he's collected this data and other data from polluted waters to offer this uh, auditory experience to, of the levels of pollution in the water. A similar beautiful artwork is this one by Sabine Ann. And she's using Winogradsky columns uh, as, my, as uh, microbial fuel cells simultaneously. These are concepts, and I said we already had enough words for today, but the principle is similar. We have a hybrid of software, uh, hardware, and in this case it's mostly hardware and biological elements. So we are constructing our own sonic cyborgs as examples. And the third and last example is speculative communi communications, which has a lot of levels. But the main level is having an, a machine vision, observing the microorganisms and collecting the information from them as a source for sound production and also for having the experience of living through the structures the microorganisms establish. So this is, of course, one of my favorite cyborg uh, expressions. So what I wanted to say is that these artworks and other artworks that we have been through their sonic dimension, they embody the desire for endosymbiotic ways of living. So this is what we were talking about before, right? So we have uh, a desire for a future of kinship. And these artworks are really giving the flesh to something that Haraway was only dreaming in 85. She says, it's like, this is like fiction, I don't know. And then all of a sudden, we are really giving flesh to these ideas. And the relation to this fundamental text is an effort to acknowledge these feminist traditions. And of course, in these two main, especially in these two main points, in the nature culture continuum and in these non-human non subjectivities. So we don't forget like who, I mean, among other authors who was thinking about it earlier on. And finally, I would like to say that is, of course, a motivation for us, an orientation not to lose the potential of action. Thank you.
Thank you, Mar. Stay, 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 stay. Um, can we have all the speakers from this panel back on stage? And exactly, can we have Leslie and Paloma pinned? <laughs> so this is our first um, hybrid live digital um, panel today. And therefore, I'm just ask Leslie and Paloma to just unmute and shout out. Um, so that we, yeah. we're looking at the people in the audience, the screen, <laughs> the real life, and so on. Um, and we're missing one panelist, Constanza. Okay, maybe she, we grab her when she comes back. Um, so maybe, first of all, I would ask the other panelists to respond to Maro's hypothesis. I love that you bring back Donna Haraway, because um, I can't let it go either since 1985, and I was born in 83. Um, and it keeps coming back and coming back. And every time you read it, it's got new, it's got new relevance. But um, is it true? Um, are, are we, have we embodied the vision? Or is that romanticizing? Are we overestimating ourselves? Is she overestimating us? And if so, what are possibly the next steps? Is there anyone that might like to respond to that? Okay, then I'm going to just throw the ball, first of all, to Leslie. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Um, I don't know. I think uh, Donna for us has been not just an, an inspiration, but some sort of like a, guide, gate, uh, like a guide into what is possible to produce in terms of uh, art and I believe it's in, very interesting the, the time we're living because uh, we can go beyond the fiction. We can now produce actual reality based on these ideas. And this is for us super powerful because we can uh, take the inspiration of living with others, understanding reality through the senses and the perception of other organisms, other uh, interpretations, agencies, and subdivisions into real life uh, context. And nine years of the existence of the collective, uh, Donna has been important, as well as Rossi, as well as um, Pickering and all these um, new materialism uh, thinkers that are empowering or, or, or imaginations, but also for us, uh, the importance of retaking the space of uh, the Latin American ancestral traditions in the same level of importance as these Western ideas. So we are sort of trying to uh, put those uh, ph philosophical levels into the same area. And I think Donna is uh, empowering us to do in that. Thank you. I think that's a very good point. And nothing against Donna really with all my heart. But I do think that um, what Bredati, for instance, brings in more is this um, sort of beyond Western centric perspectives that um, Donna Harrow was not as confronted with as a discourse at that time. Um, Nayeli, would you like to share also, also had a quote from Donna Haraway in your presentation? Um, yeah, for me, it's um, like very inspiring the part of fabulations. Um, I remember once I was listening, um, she was giving a talk and I was listening um, the way she was talking and telling like these fictional stories. And I was thinking that I also want to do with the others, like my project is made to do with others. Um, and thanks to this project, I have been getting to know, especially um, black women and women of color of taking um, the tools and transforming them and subvert them and use, it, use them for us. And I think uh, uh, for me, it was very interesting to, to like, as, a, as the quote said, like, it matters uh, what stories, who is telling the stories. Um, and it matters a lot for us. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and maybe one thing just to add to that, the beautiful thing about um, Donna Harry's figurations, I think, is that she's always disregarding them herself. So she's always moving on and making new figurations and critiquing her own figurations. And so probably in that point, 
before we romanticize them, maybe we have to think what would be, we have to confront ourselves and say, what would be the, the next figurations that would help us um, sort of develop our thinking? What's the next figuration then, Varo? I mean, of course, right now we're very uh, thinking about the notion of trans species, like the transness is right now like what, where we're, we're dreaming and how to accomplish it materially, just not like speculative. And we are, of course, discovering a lot of uh, organisms that are mixed. And of course, uh, also like biologically understanding the uh, like a grayscale and the, the stop in taxonomical divisions because we're actually, you know, organisms in flow instead. I think maybe through that we can start thinking. Yeah, and maybe also I think um, what Nayeli and Costanza brought, uh, both brought up, the looking also sometimes back at um, pre-colonial knowledges and, and systems, ways of, uh, you reacted, that's good, so you can counter me. But, um, you know, also when it comes to potential digital computing, I mean, right now movements like ethno computing, or indigenous computing, and all of these things, it's creating at least a discussion space to think, can we radically change the base of computing um, by sometimes looking at entirely different logics that might get us out of the binary that we so love to recreate digitally and in lived materialized realities. Um, I like the reaction. I mean, I'm, I might, I am for sure biased, but in the work of interspecifics, <laughs> there's like a high regard to also thinking uh, other indigenous approaches. You know, that's what we're thinking in terms of a codex and also thinking about non-human intelligence. So it works uh, before, before I joined them. So it's not so biased. Uh, they have <laughs> several works that are really reflecting on the on the notion of non-human intelligences, in, not only in terms of artificial intelligence, but also in terms of the intelligence of microorganisms. So how do microorganisms organize? How do microorganisms uh, communicate? And of course, we are doing a huge effort of like trying to find our own uh, local indigenous cosmovisions. And, and this relates for us in terms of the animism. So how do we think of the algorithm as a living entity but also of, of the hardware that is that we're working with as a, a like a like a living entity so it's somehow thinking thinking ancient thinking to to move into the future to imagine our new figurations yeah i think it's a beautiful point and also um i think a lot of the values that you brought up um in your talk of kinship and care and affection and there is of course right now um, the feminist new materials discourses of care and they're also very important but i think they're also other concepts of kinship and care, for instance, from Amazonian um, cosmologies, which would also expand that discussion of care, a discussion that's also been capitalized very quickly um, and turned into a whole new product series, which we can now consume. Um, but to look at these, you know, other forms of and ideas of care, which are also beyond Western ideas of care. Um, do we have questions, comments from the audiences, please? I have to ask you to come up to the microphone for the streaming and recording. Hello, me again. Thank you so much for a super inspiring presentation, panel-wise. First of all, I want to say it really resonates with New Zealand <clears throat> because equally, walking into the future, looking backwards is something that is underlying the entire culture and way of understanding your own identity in that culture. And of course, I am not of that culture, but I've been teaching craft and um, contemporary craft in New Zealand for 25 years now. So what really resonated with me in this panel is when we're talking about ideas, um, what really came forward was the learning through the haptic and the touch, looking at knots and understanding a kipu by making one. And also I imagining by into the algorithmic um, interspecies, it is extremely different for the audience looking at the imagery to the creators that are actually somewhat more haptically engaged in the making. I, and I'm really liking to hear from all of you the knowledge and the, uh, you know, when we're talking about knowledge and uh, and life forms and reproduction and how do we access knowledge that might be lost and how important the haptic is and which is also in the feminist discourse. Thank you. 
<laughs> Anyone? Importance of haptic craft. Am I exporting haptics? Is over there? So. Um, yeah, um, in in my project, um, like involving um, like this um, the texture and the fact that it is important to connect with all the senses to the to the piece, it is also related to to what I'm like trying to look in the past and how all the senses were involved to to understand and to be connected. Um, and I think uh, with the kipu, which is a multidimensional way of communication, which now we we because of the of the way we are changing our perspectives that we communicate in so few characters and we continue like evolving so fast. Um, I think that with the 3D printed pieces, I wanted to to bring this factor that it's. Um, that it's precisely involving all the senses. Um, and uh, yeah, for me, it was very important with this project to, to also take a look in the past and deconstruct myself because I am constructed in a way where uh, I learn in, under some systems, under colonial systems of understanding my reality. Um, so with this project, I really struggle, uh, struggle to understand um, other other perspectives because I I discovered myself making some mistakes um, like getting biased by some information um, and I think like all in all like the project like being digital being physical helped me to open my mind I wouldn't say that I'm totally deconstructed uh, but uh, yeah that's something I really wanted to point out. Um, I am not an indigenous person. I am I'm coming from Latin America, but um, I am, oh, how to say, um, broken somehow, um, like uh, overturned by this history where I come from. So uh, for me, it was also important to make a review, not a romantic, uh, romanticize the past, um, that's also important in my project. I don't want to romanticize. Um, I don't want to romanticize cultures. I don't want to romanticize the, the, and the indigenous perspectives as well. Yeah. Did you want to add? Paloma or Leslie, quieren decir algo? Sobre... I'm sorry, do you want to say something yeah. about it? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you want to mention something about a touch? No, you're good. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I'm good. Well, I think we I can say about uh, the haptics of uh, working on the biolabs, for example, the importance of, uh, you know, when you're on space collecting soil and getting your hands dirty and then the, the whole process of extraction of bacteria, like all these is, spaces are super important, but at the, at the end, and in our practice, we are sort of like a creating an alternative reality for those organisms, which is the problem of science. Like you, you don't have a real space of observation. You have a synthetic space of observation and haptics. So everything becomes uh, hyper, hyper clean, hyper specialized, hyper synthetic. And then uh, that's uh, in a way like a, a, connecting those organisms into a sort of a matrix of human condition and observation. And, but I, I think it's important that before uh, we got into all these um, ideas of recreating uh, symbiotic uh, processes, we spend a lot of time on, on the laboratory uh, working with bacteria, trying to understand uh, the, the ways and also with other organisms like slime mold. And it was very uh, interesting for me, the transitions of going between nature into the lab and, and how these uh, transitions disconnects you from the ecosystemic into the specific and uh, the relation that this action has 
in the way that contemporary science is expressing itself into the politics and logics of control of uh, economical and capitalistic work. Thank you. Do you have, yes, Chris? Chris has questions from or, the online. Yeah, from the online audience. live chat from uh, YouTube. Uh, first, Taiko Nomiya versus a, a comment said every single concept in Maro Paper's presentation opens up so many interesting avenues to explore. Thank you very much. And then she also asked the question, where did the inspiration uh, come from for Maro to use biology to explain and illustrate social phenomena? Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I don't I don't completely agree with the idea of using biology to illustrate something, but rather I would think that we are biology, right? So how do we understand the processes that we are embedded in? A little bit breaking this idea of our, you know, artificialness or our humanness, you know, how do we relate? And I would never want to use biology to justify anything that we're doing, but rather to understand ourselves completely embedded in these sets of relationships and how these hormones make us do what we do and our relationships to everything. And also to take responsibility. Sometimes we want to justify the things that we do because we're, you know, this animal or this thing, but rather it's the other way around. This physicality and this body uh, makes us and allows us to take responsibility, this affectionate responsibility, right? So I think uh, more than using biology as a justification or figuration to understanding what is happening socially, is like completely understanding ourselves as biological bodies. And that in from that place of care and, and we take responsibility as well. But thank you very much for the question. Do we have any last questions? Yes, please. I may ask uh, Leslie to uh, maybe help me explain the setup for the, their recording for the bacteria developed on the culture, like uh, kind of what, what equipment they use for taking the video and how long usually you measure this experiment. This, I, I know it's very detailed, but I'm so very interested in this AI uh, uh, things uh, like applied to the toxinomic Thank you. Yeah, well, actually, uh, the source material is uh, uh, the data sets are uh, pictures of microorganisms. They're static. So the process is uh, what I love about artificial intelligence. So to understand your question, I have to explain the difference in between programmatic coding and artificial intelligent processes, which is if I want to program an animation of a bacteria, I have to tell my program from the beginning to the end, what's the supposed behavior I want to create. In the case of artificial intelligence, uh, we are teaching with examples to a machine how something looks like. And we sort of created a companion softwares for the artificial intelligence. Uh, in order to take the intelligence into a further process of development. So they just uh, extract the characterization of the microorganisms is observing, and then, then the companion software helps the artificial intelligence to articulate mo movement, uh, behavior, growth, and things get into a, a much more interesting um, outcome than just having the artificial intelligence alone producing uh, by themselves uh, what is interpreted in as uh, microorganisms. So that's why we're into the realm of morphological aspects because it's about how microorganisms look and how they behave and how they can behave in a virtual environment. But for us, in order to do that, we have to create this ecosystem of algorithms where the artificial intelligence is the central system that generates uh, expressions of complexity and then we have these other uh, companion systems that are in charge of for example organizing taxonomical orders uh, exploring the space to find uh, characterizations similar to growth or uh, cellular division, for example, there is something that happens inside the system. And then we have other softwares that help those to, for example, create 
uh, animations and then produce the videos and then we have other ones that produce the three-dimensional aspects and of course in all this process the um, uh, let's say the thread that interwinds the process is our human perception of what these uh, symbiotic relationships are so uh, for us this uh, artificial intelligence is also collaborator uh, and part in, in an agency and a way of expression that is very important for this, this process at this point. Thank you, Leslie. Okay, any last questions? No, then I would say thank you so much to the speakers of the panel. And then for the last little few minutes, I would ask some of my colleagues to come up and join me um, to round up a little bit today, the discussions. And um, I think rather than summarizing or rounding up, also a little bit thinking about what we can take on from the panels today. Sorry, Linus is saying to me, I should go in here. Uh, what we can take with us tomorrow um, to discuss further on the second conference day. So perhaps we want to share some reflections on the three panels and hmm? we fit. Look at that. We have a wide lens. <laughs> Anyone that would like to start? Yeah, first of all, um, just go somewhere here. We see more than you see here. <laughs> uh, first of all, um, we want to um, thank the audience, the on-site audience here, to bear with us for three long complex panels and a lab tour and many conversations. And um, also we want to thank the online audience to bear with us and to put questions and to comment. Um, summing up a whole conference day is always a weird conundrum, so we would not even want to start with it, but there are some ideas and I see already a lot of interesting entanglements and references and cross references from speakers from even different panels to one another. So maybe what we could take with us into the evening and sleep over and dream off and then modulate it and come back tomorrow again and walk them through is um, at least what I could actually take on my uh, evening journey. Um, I guess what encompasses all contributions is um, thinking and living and researching through processes, through time and space and the phenomenon of living systems and as very much uh, embracing a non-anthropocentric perspective by doing so. And what I think is also encompassing is um, somehow metabolic systems is um, from a philosophical point of view, either be it from an anthropological point of view, being from an artistic point of view, a performative point of view, be it for a um, biosystemic point of view, um, being from a deconstructive point of view. Uh, I think this was really encompassing for most of us um, presenting today. Um, I think there was a lot of speakers acknowledging going back into old knowledges. That was really uh, remarkable um, for all of us. Um, going, be it let be it uh, pre-colonial knowledges or uh, auntie wisdom or um, ancestral knowledge or knowledge going back into back older generations um, or actually very very much back into ancient times. Um, that uh, appreciation and that openness uh, was really remarkable today. Um, and in several panels, we could see that. 
not only Bricebrook sisters and Oran were pointing this out, but I think also Constanza and Nayeli in the last panel was um, particularly um, outspoken for that approach. So actually just bringing knots and not knots and relations and, uh, and connections to different contributions, maybe we could also say that um, social fermentation as we started uh, our projects, the four of us now conferring the six of us and even all of us here, I think in starting with Rice Brewing Sisters, I think there was also a red thread that went through um, basically maybe metaphorically or indirectly or intentionally to most of this presentations today, fermenting. And maybe tomorrow on our walks, as we all invite you also still to come along with us, um, elasticity is probably a term that we, um, dear sisters, that we will pick up tomorrow and elaborate further on. Um, then the viral performance by Pei Ying is something with the viral human cohabitation is something also from the pandemic point of view backwards is something that we definitely will continue to discuss. And uh, of course, Oron, the biotechnological um, biotech criticism is something that I would really like to invite us all to pick up tomorrow on our walks. Um, maybe we can actually bring big criticism into our discussions tomorrow when we walk along the river, maybe. Let's keep this to the river. And um, so, um, and thinking about um, biotech um, hypocrisies and deconstructing them is something that we probably should continue tomorrow. What I really liked from Sename's presentation, and we can also pick this up um, in our discussion tomorrow, is the idea of cosmogeny and um, also the learning from the Lele people and learning from looking backwards. And then again, um, symbiogenesis was tangled and touched by several perspectives. Kamak um, talked about her project of the hollow beyond and um, Marvin also said, um, turned and stressed the symbiogenesis aspect. And um, maybe also we could encompass um, the symbiosis, endosymbiosis, all these terms that were um, several times mentioned. Um, maybe we can end with, never end, but maybe my little contribution I'd like to end now is, um, I liked Nayeli how you said, it's all to reconsider consider and re in brackets, we consider language and communication. Because as much as we want to become non-human or as much as we want to be step out of our anthropocentric view as humans, we just cannot. And even here in the conference, we talk and stumble with language. So maybe I like this, Nayeli, how you said, we have to reconsider maybe, and as you said, uh, very impressive, we have to maybe create our own systems and languages. So maybe this is something I take home with and I'd like to pick it up tomorrow. So my hand over. Maybe just a reminder tomorrow. So to meet tomorrow, everyone's here is invited uh, at Art Laboratory Berlin at 10.30. Uh, we'll give a tour of the exhibition from the curator's point of view and then break into panels uh, for walk and talks around the area of either along the Panka River or to the Elizabeth uh, or different locations in the, out and around uh, Art Laboratory Berlin. And also, if you're interested, there are still a few places for Ira Agrivian's workshop uh, and uh, in, the, in the afternoon. And if you're listening he either here and you can't make tomorrow or you're listening online and you're not in Berlin, but you will be later in June, we have a workshop with the uh, Rice Brewing Sisters Club on the 4th of June. And we have the performance with Pei Ying Lin and Soy Division on the 11th of June. Uh, so you know, we'll check our website, register, contact us if you have any questions. Um, so.
No, I hardly can uh, um, uh, add anything. Thank you for your wonderful words. I also had the the feeling um, I'm a bit torn. Like it started so dramatically, you know, from Australia, and then so much hope from the rice brewing sisters. And I think throughout the day, I, I feel like that's in the world we're living in. And I thought, oh my God, no, we can't not change anything. And yes, we can. So I think um, that constantly. Um, yeah, I would like to thank you again all for for joining uh, virtually and in presence. I think it's so nice to see one another again. And um, yes, uh, whoever wants to enjoy now um, the real or the other real social or beyond social, um, uh, join us in the beer garden um, for an, a nice drink. And maybe I should say it, Chris, it's your birthday today. And... <laughs> Very, very happy birthday, I think, from all of us. And if you'd like to sing live, I think you can do that. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, Michelle, you want to close? Or you? I think we can also sing at the beer garden. Um, so we will be, maybe that's not on a live stream, not with the microphone in my hand. But uh, we will be going to the Schleusenkrug still, correct? I think... There is no storm right now. <laughs> so uh, whoever would like to have um, a cold beer or however, there's also food there and snacks and so if you like, and it's a 12 minute walk from here, um, then I think follow the art laboratory because um, the Urika TU team will be just um, putting some things away here. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michelle, Florian and uh, the colleagues uh, for um, hosting us today. That was so heartwarming and thank you so much. It was a beautiful sur surrounding. I can also repeat what the audience uh, told me in the breaks, that it was um, a really, really pleasant space and atmosphere to confer, to come together and to mingle. So thank you so much. <laughs>